Good evening, everyone. This is October 18th, 2022. This is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Cupertino City Council. Would you please join us in pledging allegiance to our nation's flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, could you please conduct the roll call? Council Member Moore? Here. Council Member Way? Here. Council Member Willie? Here. Vice Mayor Chow? Here. Mayor Paul? Here. Okay, I'm going to ask our City Council to join me on the dais. We have three presentations for ceremonial matters and proclamations this evening. Item number one is the consideration of a proclamation recognizing October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And uh, from Maitri, we have Bishaka Chatterjee and Tejeswi Dada to uh, accept our proclamation this evening. And so if you would please uh, come up to the dais with us and we will provide that proclamation as well as a, a couple of minutes to uh, speak before the presentation of the proclamation. Welcome and thank you so much for all that you do. And do you uh, care to say a few words about Domestic Violence Awareness Month? Yes, um, so good evening. <laughs> good evening, um, Mayor and everybody else in the council and the public. Uh, my name is Bishaka Chatterjee and I have been a resident of Cupertino for the last 20 years. Today I stand here as an advocate for domestic violence victims and survivors. I represent my three, an organization that has been serving domestic violence victims and survivors since 1991. I would like to take a moment to speak a little bit about domestic violence. Uh, it is a scourge that affects every, uh, every section of our society, irrespective of race, culture, gender, uh, economic, um, economic background, or educational qualifications. Um, would you like to say something? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think we are here today essentially um, to accept the proclamation, but also to request the city to honor uh, some of the requests we have that might help it uh, make it more trauma informed and accessible for survivors. I think uh, Bishaka kind of listed three of the things that would be very useful. So I can hold it for so, you as you read it. Yeah. So uh, I would like to uh, I would like to request the city to support and enact policies that take an intersectional approach to domestic violence, homelessness, reproductive rights, and poverty reduction, to, say, uh, to name a few. Support funding for domestic violence service providers at the federal, state, county, and city levels. And rethink law enforcement responses to crisis situations with a special focus on trainings on domestic violence. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. And thank you for being here for accepting the proclamation for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. But more importantly, thank you for everything that you do in your daily lives to uh, help the plight of people uh, suffering from this scourge, as you very rightly called it, of domestic violence. We greatly appreciate your work. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll take the
And our second proclamation this evening is a note of appreciation to our code enforcement officers. And I believe one of our code enforcement officers uh, is here tonight, Monica Diaz, to accept the proclamation for code enforcement officer appreciation. Uh, is it a month or a week that we have? I believe it's, it might be a week, right? It's a week. So Code Enforcement Officer Appreciation Week. Monica, thank you for everything that you do to help keep our community safe. Is there anything that you'd like to say in, uh, on behalf of the Code Enforcement Officers of Cupertino? Just a sure note to thank everyone for their support, not just the council and Mr. Mayor yourself, but our departments that we work with, um, city attorneys here, our city managers here, and my, our, my department head, Ben, and my supervisor, Albert, as well as my code enforcement officers team, which encompasses Marvin Aguilar and Jeff Travis, as well as Dan Vasquez. So thank, thanks to everyone for making the program successful, and thank you guys for the opportunity. Thank you, Monica, greatly appreciated. Okay, item number three, we're very uh, grateful, and I know I speak on uh, behalf of each and every one of the council members for the work of the Cupertino Library Foundation in supporting the efforts of uh, the city and the city council, the staff, to bring forward this wonderful expansion of the Cupertino library space. It's a two floor uh, space that has meeting rooms and really activates uh, the bottom floor courtyard. And the Cupertino Library Foundation went on a fundraising drive to help supplement the efforts of the city of Cupertino. And so um, without uh, further ado, I'd like to ask our members of the Cupertino Library Foundation, Kieran Varshnaya, as well as Jim Davis, uh, to come on up to the dais. I believe uh, Kieran uh, may have a few words and Jim may have a uh, relatively large piece of paper to uh, provide to the city. Welcome, Kieran and Jim. Well, um, today I'm here as the president of Cupertino Library Foundation. My name is Kiran Varshnia, and we are um, we are a non-profit organization. We are advocate uh, for the library and for the community. We provide creative and financial support to the Cupertino Library. So the funds that we have raised, um, and we are very happy to hand over that to the city today, is for an amount of $229,465. The funds have been donated by our community and by businesses here in our community. We are forever, forever grateful for their contribution. Uh, we also want to thank Mayor Darcy Paul for your leadership through this project, really from the start to the end. Uh, also thank you to Vice Mayor Liang Chao and all the esteemed uh, city council members for your support uh, for this really wonderful project. I have to say a word of appreciation for our city manager, the city staff, for the outcome that we see today, the result we have right in front of us, and for successfully completing the project despite all the challenges of the last couple of years. So thank you for all your efforts. I cannot leave this place without saying thank you to our Cupertino librarian, Claire Varecio all the staff here at Cupertino Library, and also thank you to Santa Clara County Library District for their support. And most of all, I am going to say thank you to our patrons, all our community. Uh, Cupertino Library is the most visited library in the district. It has about 3,000 visitors a day. 
So we want to invite you all to come and see the new program spaces. And they're also available for our community, for community events and meetings. Thank you so much. And, uh, and we have a certificate of appreciation that we'd like to provide to the Library Foundation as well. And uh, would our community librarian like to join us for this photo op? Claire, come on up. Yeah, come on up. Claire Verezio, everyone. Thank you, Claire. Excellent, job well done everyone. And uh, everyone, that is our ceremonial matters and proclamations for uh, this evening. We are going to go and transition to a hybrid meeting now. A couple of our council members will be taking this uh, meeting from a remote location so that we can have uh, proper social distancing on the dais at this time. And so we will take a 15 minute break. We'll return in 15 minutes to uh, resume the rest of our regular meeting. Thanks so much. Hey, hello everyone, we're at 7.15, starting up again with the meeting. We are now at postponements and orders of the day. Let me check in with our city clerk first. Uh, Madam City Clerk or Madam City Manager, are there any postponements and orders of the day affecting this agenda? No postponements, Mayor. Okay, none. Um, let's go to Council. Are there any requests for postponements or uh, rearrangements of the uh, current agenda this evening? Uh, I'll go by a show of hands. We have one hand raised, and that is from Council Member Moore. Council Member Moore, uh, what is your request under this item? Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor Paul. So if I do have a second, I I'm, would like to see item 17 move to consent. Uh, Council Member Moore requests item 17 move to consent. Uh, I'll go by a show of hands for a second, and item number 17 uh, is the review of crosswalk options across Rodriguez Avenue. Um, and is there a second for that? If there's none, I will go ahead and second that request. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, see if there is any uh, desire for discussion. I don't see any uh, hands raised further. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the table. Um, Madam City Clerk, uh, please conduct a roll call vote on this uh, proposed order of the day. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Way? Aye. Council Member Willie? Aye. Vice Mayor Chow? Oh, aye. Mayor Paul? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, and I will uh, remind our um, colleagues and members of the public that if you do care to speak to an item that is on consent, we will have an omnibus. Um, opportunity if that item doesn't get pulled from the consent calendar as well when we arrive at that set of items on our agenda this evening. The next uh, item or category I should say in our agenda is oral communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the council on any matter within the jurisdiction of the council and not on the agenda. The total time for oral communications will ordinarily be limited to one hour. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes. I will go to our Zoom function first and then our live speakers. Um, we have one hand raised from the public on Zoom. That is from Shawnee Kleinhaus. And now I see San R. Um, as we stated, we will have three minutes for each comment. If your hand is raised on Zoom or if you have a blue card in, uh, within the time that the first person is done speaking, your your comment will um, will be called upon. And if you send an email to city clerk, that is all one word at cupertino.org, uh, within that uh, time that the first speaker is speaking, then you will also be called upon. I have two other blue cards that have been filled out in advance. They are from Niharika Amani and Rick Kitson as well. And so as of now, we have Shawnee Kleinhaus, San R and the two blue cards. Shani, welcome, and 
you will have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Paul and Council Members. My name is Shani Kleinhaus. I'm the Environmental Advocate for the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. In the past few weeks, residents have been coming to this forum to speak about the golf course and whether it should be retained or returned to nature. This evening, I wish to provide some context and historical perspective. In 2014, after completing a wonderful Model Creek restoration project, Cupertino considered the alternative for public recreation and enjoyment of the Stevens Creek corridors, McClellan Ranch, Blackberry Farm, Golf Course, and Stockermeyer Orchards. Three recreation intensive, intensive alternatives were initially considered. All three would have had severe impact on the sensitive riparian corridor and the many, many residents who enjoy its beauty, the wildlife, the birds, and the natural resources there. So Audubon advocated with the city to choose a fourth alternative, one that was focused on protection and enjoyment of nature. And I remember racing along Stevens Creek on a muddy trail with Barry Chung in the rain and walking with you, Mayor Paul, and your newborn baby, um, looking at the creek and the birds and nature there. Audubon did not, at the time, advocate for the elimination of the golf course. Our proposed alternative uh, four did not choose between golf and nature. It just looked to have activities that were compatible with the creek and not too intensive. In 2014, the residents of Cupertino echoed us prefer our preference in surveys, in letters, in public meetings, and council listened to the community and set aside the three alternatives and moved forward with the fourth one, which allowed the trail and some uh, improvements, but not to the extent that the three alternatives had. Now, more than 4,000 people are responding to surveys about the future of the golf course. In over a decade of advocacy, I have never seen such strong response to any park issue in any of the cities in our county, not even San Jose, which is so much bigger, and on issues that I thought people should engage in. So Cupertino should be proud of its engaged public and how much people care and find the middle ground. We at Audubon, we prefer the natural alternative, but we respect community sentiment and your judgment. And we hope that you find a way to have the golf course be better for the wildlife that are along the creek and um, not eliminate an amenity that so many people care about, just find a way to make it better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shani. And, um, I note that the city clerk handed me a couple of uh, additional blue cards there from Jenny Huang and Rhoda Fry. And Madam City Clerk, were there any emails that came in uh, during this time to your account? Yes, Mayor, I was handed one email to read. Okay, so there's one email after um, the uh, blue cards. And so we also have San R and Jenny on uh, Zoom. And so welcome San R. Thank you, City Council, for uh, the time to speak today. I wish to um bring to your request once again the uh, request for uh, additional pedestrian crossing safety measures around the schools particularly schools without crossing guards right now uh, i'd like to request the city council to please commission a study of which schools do not have crossing guards currently and see if you can prioritize the uh, addition of crossing guards at schools i can say for a fact that there are no crossing guards at Berea Elementary and there is uh, quite a bit of traffic there and congestion and parents trying to get through to the drop off. And uh, as you know, just last month, there was a pedestrian fatality on Wolf Road. Uh, it was in adjacent Sunnyville, but 11 a.m. there was a pedestrian fatality at uh, Wolf and Inverness in case uh, that uh, was not something you were aware of. So. I request you to please prioritize this. We can't operate on uh, timelines as usual that pushes this out for the next school year. Uh, hopefully you can do everything you can to get commissioned and staffed um, crossing guards at the schools. I'd also like to request for the pedestrian activated beacon lights. I know I'd uh, sent a mail about uh, in crossing lights and the traffic engineer replied saying that, that is not uh, as reliable as the beacon lights and uh, we take beacon lights over anything else you know frankly the the crossings are totally unmanned 
and unprotected with no lights and it is unsafe for kids right now i also want to bring to your attention that as these schools are consolidated the traffic congestion especially getting into a school on the mclellan bob stelling corridor as well as feria is quite cumbersome right now and we could actually use the help of the county sheriffs in easing the traffic congestion rather than writing tickets for parents i urge the city council to walk by at school drop hours and inspect the chaos around these uh, streets uh, where we could use help from the sheriffs is to actually ease the traffic instead the riding tickets and parents that are trying to get kids to school get a ticket instead so i urge the city council please help your uh, your constituents that are dropping kids to school are not uh, are not candidates to be ticketed they are to be helped to make sure their kids are safe in getting to school thank you for your attention to this matter thank you very much san and our next speaker is jenny welcome jenny Uh, thank you, Mayor Darcy. Hi, I'm Jennifer Griffin, and um, I just wanted to bring up something. I I find this whole thing about the housing element, HCD, and all of the housing bills that the governor signed about three weeks to two weeks ago. I think they're all interrelated. Um, I I mentioned I think at a previous meeting in oral communications that the bottom of the text of AB 2097, which is the parking minimums bill by Laura Friedman that the governor signed, you know, eight, 10 days ago, and AB 2011, which is the um, Buffy Wicks um, build housing on any commercial strip bill. Both of these bills have two to three paragraphs at the end of the bill in the text referring to other bills, their passage. There's another bill that they both refer to, which is about the housing element. I think it's 2353, and I think it's Buffy's also. But um, I'm beginning to wonder why a standalone bill is referring to another bill inside of its text. Is there something here that the public is not supposed to know about? The part that's really concerning is if you read the bottom of this text, they, 2097 refers to if 2011 passes, if AB 204053, which is the housing element bill, passes, then AB 2097 will do something. And the same on and on with these other bills. Why? I, I would like to have these politicians explain to the public why these bills are not standalone bills. Why are they referring to other bills? Um, in their text. And I understand someone told me that these bills were signed as a package. Well, I'm sorry, the package part of this has been a left to discovery by the public. And I don't really feel comfortable that there has been full transparency in what these bills are supposed to be doing. I, I have felt for a long time that there was some sort of a secret agenda. The fact that both 2097 parking minimums and 2011 that let's build housing anywhere in the state on commercial are are pointing to a housing element bill makes me really wonder does that mean that the housing element whether a city certifies or not can these bills be invoked in january of 2023 because they are now legal, can they be pulled in by developers in the housing element? Mountain View was just not certified by HCD. San Francisco is not certified. I think that we're being jerked around here if we don't. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. And uh, next we go to our live speakers with blue cards. And so the first speaker is Nia Rika Amani. Welcome, Nia Rika. Mayor, she has a presentation that just she'll just need to hook up really quickly. Okay, sounds good. All right. 
Um, good evening, Council. My name is Naharika. Um, I'm an intern for Council Member Way. Um, and this summer I did a research project just analyzing the LED lighting improvements project, and I'm here to present my findings. All right, so just a brief introduction to the project itself. Um, the project is centered around sustainability, and the goal is to transition the city-based induction system to LED infrastructure entirely. Um, this both satisfies the, uh, the city's own ordinances for dark sky lighting, and generally over 2,500 lights will be modified across the city. So just a brief background into dark sky lighting in general. So dark sky lighting works by directing the light downwards instead of into the atmosphere around it, which has been shown historically to reduce light pollution as a whole. This signifies a long awaited step to, sustain to sustainability if the city decides to move forward with the project. And it also signifies how the city is willing to hold itself to the same standards that it holds private institutions. So just a quick budgeting and financial analysis that I have prepared beforehand. When you talk about the budget in this project, it's really important to look at both the short-term costs and the long-term savings. So the total, total conversion cost in the short term would be about $1 million to $1.3 million. Um, this actually airs on the lower side for such a project. San Jose did a very similar project, and they spent about $11 million while um, modifying about 10 times the uh, lights that Cupertino plans to modify. So this shows that the cost for the project is actually quite reasonable. So here I have a set of graphs that was prepared by Tanko Lighting. I, mean, I think they're very um, well prepared and they really show how much the city can save in terms of implementing this project. So here you can see that the maintenance costs for the existing system are always a lot higher than the maintenance cost for the new system and you save a hundred, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars by converting. Additionally, here's the graph showing the break-even point in terms of the long-term savings. And you can see that in about 20 years or so, you save about $2 million in annual costs. This is another graph showing the um, cumulative of opportunity costs. Um, you can see that after 25 years, you can save more than, um, it'll cost you more than 250 k if you do stick with the current induction-based lighting system. So in terms of sustainability, LED is a very important step. Um, it achieves energy, energy savings by 50% to 70% greater than injection lighting. And the need for action is really apparent as about 15 million tons of CO2 are generated per year by unsustainable outdoor lighting, according to the National Geographic. Um, so in North America alone, um, LED, sorry, light pollution incre is increasing steadily um, by about 6% per year, um, and dark sky lighting actually helps to solve this problem by directing the light towards the ground and shielding the top and sides of the light bulb, it's, light bulb itself. So this is just a quick uh, cost-benefit analysis um, according to my findings as a whole. So the costs are very short-term. It costs about one to 1.3 million, and the project will take about seven to eight years to break even. But in the long term, you will save about $2 million um, in terms of just long-term savings as a whole. And this does mitigate the effects of light pollution in Cupertino. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very well done. And appreciate it, Naharika. Thank you. OK, uh, next we have uh, Rick Kitson, welcome, Rick. Thank you. My name is Rick Kitson. I'm the executive director for the Cupertino Chamber of Commerce. Our organization has hosted the Bay Area Diwali Festival for 19 years, most recently on Saturday, October 8th. That morning, I got a call that Mr. Stephen Scharf was upset that he did not have a booth at Diwali. Although no, there are no records of Mr. Scharf ordering a booth, it is understandable that he was disappointed since candidates always attend festivals in Cupertino. Later, council member Kitty Moore told me that an urgent matter needed immediate attention. She told me and three sheriff's deputies that candidates are not allowed to have booths, nor bring signs, brochures, or any other campaign material, and insisted that they all be removed. This entire exchange 
was witnessed by a DIA TV reporter and also by sheriff's deputies with body cams. And I'm sorry that I don't have that body cam footage available for this meeting. Because of Councilmember Moore's insistence and city staff, which had been put on the spot, the deputies indicated that they would issue tickets unless all political signs were removed from the festival. The city council and school board candidates decided to pack up and leave. Enforcement of individual council member instructions is a very real problem and has exposed the city to significant legal risk under section 1983 of the United States Code, in addition to simply being a violation of the Cupertino Municipal Code. The overriding concern is that council member Moore's own political priorities were the impetus for her successful insistence that the candidates she does not support remove their signs and brochures. This looks very bad for the community, the city, and for city council. It is hoped that with the prudent judgment of the council and the guidance of professional staff that the situation will be addressed and avoided in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And our next speaker is Jenny Huang. Welcome, Jenny. Uh, I have a blue card filled out for, uh, for you, Jenny. Okay. Dear council members and guests, and I'm a member of the Huang family, and since the beginning, uh, we ask a third party, neutral party, and the due process, and we still haven't got it. We have the legal um, build up, and it was took down, and um, first one actually, um, city actually top manager at that time said it was, because only a few square foot off, they said it was okay. But second time was according to the, whatever the city rule tells us to do. And it was a take, take down, took away, and even the belongings without notice. And uh, because we speak up, and there's also retaliation now, even they imposing the um, inflated the legal fee as well. And we here again ask for the due process, ask for the neutral person that we can talk to since we are long-term residents and we haven't had any development in the, in the place at all. And then the, only the new build up was taken away. And this, and no um, direct neighbor was, uh, they will actually give us blessing on it. And there's no build up in the back as well. And uh, only 90 some square foot um, a, a play um, structure. So uh, again, ask for the, um, the ombudsman or any neutral person, we can work it out and uh, mediate this thing out. And I have actually an um, interpreter and uh, um, he, he can speak better than, than me on basically the similar stuff here. So that's, that's him right now. Okay, uh, go ahead. Okay, hello, um, good evening. My name is Peter Morris. I'm a long time friend of uh, Ms. Wang. I'm as a, as a witness, what I, seen happen is that last December that without warning or permission a demolition crew arrived on her property the, the backyard targeting a structure which had been a point of contention with the city for some years and after taking it down then there was a the next step was a contention regarding say various legal costs and fines which were being uh, uh, overseen by a legal firm in San Francisco that was delegated the responsibility of, ha of, of overseeing this. Ms. Wang, apart from whatever cost that she lost in the structure itself, has now been bombarded with massive legal fees and court filings, not to mention the amount of time that she's had to take going to court when the COVID has limited the, uh, the uh, accessibility. It would be totally punitive for the city to continue to be able to pressure her to be able to pay to pay more when she's already been hit significantly on a financial basis. And apart from being a single woman who's in essence has done nothing in the first instance of arriving to be able to cause any such actions. Again, she also oversees her parents and, uh, and I would question whether there was really any point or benefit for the city to be able to continue this. And we ask that you have some sort of dialogue with the legal firm to find out if there's a much more peaceful way to be able to resolve this, rather than just simply continuing to go and, uh, and, and just uh, make it. Thank you very target. much. That's the time for okay. this commentary. And we will go to our next speaker, and that is Rhoda Fry. Uh, thank you, Jenny, and uh, welcome, Rhoda. Um. <clears throat> Hi. 
Hi, I'm Rhoda Fry. Just want to comment briefly on the um, comments of the preceding speaker. Um, I found them to be um, opportunistic, and uh, my understanding is that the signage concern had to do with signs posted in the ground, uh, not uh, books. But anyway, I want to get on to my main topic. I'm going to talk about elections and land use. Our ballots are misleading Cupertino voters, and we are waiting for a correction from the county registrar. Candidates who participate in voluntary campaign spending lists get a diamond next to their name. Three candidates who got diamonds did not deserve them. They each raised around $50,000, some of it coming from special interests. In fact, the special interests collectively dwarfed the entire campaign of other candidates. Transparency in election is central to our democracy. This election will ultimately have to do with how our city is developed. I'm not just talking about the 50 or so acres of Valco. I'm talking about Lehigh's 3,500 acres that are up for grabs for new land uses. A number of industries are now considering the property which is accessed by rail with a sizable rail yard. Supervisor Simidian has in indicated that the land use up there would be something less impactful than the cement plant. Refineries in the East Bay are less impactful than the cement plant. We must be prepared to advocate for appropriate land use. Now I'll tell you a cautionary tale and step back to February 1992 at Cupertino's Planning Commission, where I was, right next door. Lehigh, then owned by Kaiser Cement, announced the developer's vision of the century, of the, sorry, the developer's vision of the city of the 21st century. The ambitious plan would build up to 3,200 homes served entirely by public transportation, eliminating the need for cars. Naturally, this project would necessitate annexing the property from an incorporated county to city. Prior to this announcement, all the pieces were in place to make it happen. In 1985, Corey Executive Tom Lagan served on the County Board of Supervisors and attempted to relax housing density on hillsides. County Council said that he could vote, but the FPP said it disagreed. Around 1990, former Quarry employee Barb Carpel served on our city council and the backbed board. When she ran for supervisor, Smidian outed her for taking too much money from her former employer and for not reporting a contribution from Assembly Jim Kinnean, who later became a consultant for Lehigh. So, now, the task at hand is about considering uh, that the county is considering new uses there. We know the county has not been there for us in 2019. They told us a legal truck between the two quarries was legal. It was not. Thanks to our city council, we put an end to this. And this is why transparency in elections and land use are inextricably connected. We, we need to keep our eyes Thank you, Rhoda. That's you. three minutes. And so. Uh, Madam City Clerk, I think you had indicated that there was one email that had come in during the uh, uh, time of the first speaker, and so if you would read three minutes of that uh, and, and also indicate uh, from what member of the public this is from. Thank yes, you. Mayor, I was handed an email um, from a member of the public here from Ann Ezit, and um, it is as follows, Dear Mayor Paul, Vice Mayor Chow, Council Member Willie, and Council Member Moore, I hope the council will continue to look into the finances of the city and get Cupertino on track and bring it into the digital age regardless of the outcome of the election. It is hard to believe that the city had evergreen contracts that went unexamined and verbal contracts without deliverables until the current council did some investigating. Verbal contracts and evergreen contracts are bad on so many levels. Things change and contracts need to be examined and adjusted depending on circumstances and economics. I would argue that this way of doing business is patently absurd. Some argue that the city no longer has a good relationship with nonprofits, including a former mayor. Well, I would probably want to maintain a good relationship with the city if I was getting money for no reason. I am happy that the gravy train is coming to an end. To Mayor Paul and Councilmember Willie, I want to express my appreciation for all that you've done over the last years to improve our city. You have been honest when it was painful. You have been spent time away from your children listening to whining residents, dealt with messy personnel issues, and been pressured by big money interests all for the common good. Thank you. Best regards, Brooke Ezit. Thank you, Madam City Clerk, and thank you to Brooke. Um, let's go to our next item on the agenda, and that should be under reports by council and staff. Item number four, 
is a set of brief reports on council member activities and brief announcements. And so I'll remind my colleagues, uh, these should be about a minute each. And so I'll go by a show of hands on Zoom, please, uh, so that I can have a common frame of reference. If anybody would like to uh, give some brief reports on their council member activities and brief announcements ever since October 4th, uh, when we last had a regular meeting. And so the order will be council member Wei followed by vice mayor Chow, council member Wei. Thank you, Mayor Paul. So very briefly, on October 10th, I attended the Finance and Administrative Community Meeting of Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Um, it's really a um, community meeting that precludes the board meeting. So we examine the uh, finance reports and administrative practices um, so that it is really uh, very transparent. Silicon Valley Clean Energy is doing very well. Uh, sorry, uh, Council Member Wei, this is the non-committee reports at this time uh, right this is not like i'm not on committee this is kind of a sort a different committee okay it's not got it. official committee, sorry okay, okay no worries and yeah and it's because councilman willie is on the official committee this is like a part committee so it's not my assignment okay okay another one is um uh we attended the cal city's peninsula division executive board committee so it's also not on my assignment um it's planning for the next seminar so i'm hoping that every one of you can attend and um, the third one is October 11th. I attended the Silicon Valley Community Foundation's annual meeting report. It is really a very good foundation that helps a lot of nonprofit in Silicon Valley and some in our own city. And I really enjoyed their report. And October 13th, I attended the Foothill De Anza Foundation's town hall that reported on what the Foothill Foundation does. It is very important education um, in organization in our community. So um, we have a good relationship with them. I really think our students um, are doing very well at the end of Foothill and the foundation is raising money to help the students. And I think that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Council Member Wei. And next we have Vice Mayor Chow. Hi. I'd like to take this time to address something happened. I'm reading an email that I send to the city clerk. I'm told by some Cupertino residents about this rule. No campaign sign, yacht signs can touch the, gr the ground point, point on public order, property. Yeah. Uh, our city attorney wishes can to speak, I Chris? Uh, I, this, this, I, I'm, I'm afraid that this item is, is not on the agenda this evening, uh, Vice Mayor Chow. I thought with this item, we can respond to public comment um, that the issue brought up. Uh, you, if, if there is confusion, I think we should correct the misinformation. Uh, no, th I, I'm afraid that this item is not on the agenda, so having a discussion of it wouldn't be appropriate at this time. Um, it's just my comment. We are not having a discussion. Your comment is it w would be t discussing something that's not agendized. But we often respond, right? I, I, I'm advising you that it would be inappropriate to have this discussion at this time. Um, Let's move on to another topic. And, and just to clarify, the follow-ups okay, are really direction to count. To, advice to, taken. Yes. Council Member Moore does apply even harsher rules to other volunteers of council candidates. Yard signs not on stake are not even allowed to touch the ground. That, and that's the information I actually consulted with the city attorney and the city clerk. And I was confused about this rule also. That I want to make it clear. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. And we will next go to Council Member Willie. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Mayor. Well, I kind of thought I'd be the, the tail end. Nobody has mentioned the uh, Diwali Festival on Saturday the 8th. Wow, it was so great to see so many people come back. We had it last year, but uh, it really didn't have the, the numbers that this year had and the number of booths and so I was really pretty energized by how much it has uh, come back. I'd also like to just mention, you know, there was the one resident uh, talking about the structure removal. I would just suggest that they contact the city attorney and maybe the city attorney can uh, uh, provide some more narrative to the uh, associate of the person we want to make sure the residents do in fact get to where they can get the answers that they uh, are seeking. So I'll just mention it in that regard. Thank you very much, Mayor. Good for now. Thank you, Councilmember Woolley. Next we have Councilmember Moore. 
All right. Um, thank you, Mayor Paul. So on October 7th, I attended the Women in Construction career event, and that was put on by the NorCal Carpenters Union. And there I got to operate a mobile crane, which was pretty exciting. And I got to check out some modern surveying equipment, and the event is put on to encourage women to get into the construction trades. And there was a great turnout, and I, and I wish them the best. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Council Member Moore. Um, I have a few items to report of, uh, I think, some, some interest. Uh, former Mayor of Los Angeles, uh, Antonio Villaraigosa, was um, tapped by Governor uh, Newsom to reach out to you know, various uh, cities across the state uh, to talk about the uh, allocation of California uh, of the $100 billion in uh, federal infrastructure money that's coming. And so um, Mayor Villaraigosa invited a, a few of us, uh, including Mayor Pat Burt um, and um, you know, a few of the other mayors in this area to uh, have an initial discussion. And so that, that was very productive on uh, October 5th. On October 7th, the Historical Society of our city had an exhibit opening. It was entitled Darshana, which uh, came, of course, uh, the day before the Diwali Festival, which was uh, mentioned on October 8th. Um, I and uh, I think at least uh, one of my colleagues uh, participated in the double 10 day ceremony, uh, which was at the county headquarters. And um, I also uh, attended the Women in Trades event with uh, Councilmember Moore, and I had invited uh, Vice Mayor Chow as well, but um, you know, I, I think uh, scheduling uh, conflicts uh, prevented that. So th those are my uh, item uh, four report outs. And so we are now on to item five, which is our report on committee assignments. And uh, this is our uh, set of uh, reports for our, for our formal committee assignments, which are going to be um, changing at the end of December. And so uh, let's go to uh, hands on Zoom again for um, these reports on the various representations that we have throughout the county and area. And so I don't see any hands raised yet, so let me go. Uh, actually, there's uh, Council Member Willie has a hand raised. Council Member Willie. Yeah, I'm happy happy to go first if there's no other hand. So we did have our uh, you know, Silicon Valley Clean Energy had our monthly uh, uh, meeting and update. Um, although there are several different topics, the ones that mean the most to me are the ones that you know the community can get um, uh, more engaged with, and that is the new construction reach codes, and that's always a a, a prime topic until we get all the cities to pass it. We approved our update to our Muni code right before this meeting in the study session um, so that we are one of the several that now have already passed that update. And then uh, the uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy is continually uh, reinforcing that the goal is 100% carbon free uh, by 2035. You know, we'd actually like it to happen sooner, but uh, based on the state's requirements and what we feel we can achieve, the 2035 is at least the, the target on paper. Silicon Valley Clean Energy also has a very uh, highly rated uh, website for community information. Come and see what grants are available, what ways you can do to reduce your uh, uh, energy consumption, and it's called eHub. So just go to the Silicon Valley Clean Energy website and you'll see the different links and you can open up any of them that are of interest to you. So that's it for this week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Council Member Willie. Next, we have Council Member Moore. Okay, thank you, Mayor Paul. So on the 13th, um, of October, I chaired the VTA PAC, um, and most of our discussion was about how to consider geographic distribution in the 2016 Measure B bike and pedestrian planning studies competitive grant program criteria. And we, ha we had a really interesting discussion about how to work with the, the, the point scoring that they have for each of the criteria items. 
and we weighed the pros and cons of moving numbers around and ultimately we decided that we did not need to hold it to a 100 point total score and we increased it to 105 so that the tiebreaker which had been geographic distribution became a criteria item and that is our recommendation to the board uh, for VTA which uh, Mayor Paul sits on so you'll be seeing our suggestions coming up in the future. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Councilmember Moore. And I don't see further hands raised, and so I will briefly report out that on October 6th, we did have our VTA board meeting. On October 13th, we had the Santa Clara County Cities Association board meeting. Unfortunately, I had a, conf uh, a conflict scheduling um, the uh, board meeting, and so I thank uh, both uh, Councilmember Moore and Vice Mayor Chow, uh, who is my alternate on the Cities Association board uh, for attending that in my stead. And so I don't see further hands raised at this time. And so um, uh, Vice Mayor Chow, you are now raising your hand. You care to report out on item five, please. So yeah, I attended the Cities Association as alternate. Um, initially, I have a, a conflict with another board me, uh, meeting that I am a member of, but then I left that board meeting in order to join the city's association around 7.30. Fortunately, um, there was an important item of uh, city's association is going to form a joint powers uh, authority. And uh, we asked for a comparison table between joint JPA and uh, 501c3. Um, the reason given for JPA was they do a lot of advocacy, which is not allowed in 501c3. And but I'm not. A, I think we need more transparency on what kind of advocacy that they do to to justify to form a JPA and I hope that more information will be coming. And then once the agreement is approved, it will come to all the city council for approval so that they can form the new JPA. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Vice Mayor Chow. We are on to item number six, and this is our report on subcommittee assignments. And so I will look to my colleagues to see if there are any report outs on any subcommittees that uh, we sit on. And Council Member Moore, your hand is raised. Did you want to report out on any subcommittee assignments? I'll defer to someone. Uh, Council Member Moore defers at this time. I do have one request. Um, I believe that uh, one of our uh, hires uh, that will be directly assisting City Council uh, will be the legislative aid. My understanding is that um, that request for applications is out right now. Um, I had had a discussion with our city manager last week and uh, the recommendation was if council wants to get involved in um, a uh, part of the interviewing process for the legislative aid, then uh, the suggestion be that we form a subcommittee. And so I would like to have that as a future item on our uh, agenda, perhaps on November 1st, uh, to discuss a subcommittee for that purpose. So that is my subcommittee request. Um, I don't believe I have subcommittee report outs, but let me think for a moment. Um, I did have a really excellent meeting um, in addition to the really, uh, I, I, I wanna thank you, um, City Manager Wu, for uh, the, the quality of the meetings that we've been having uh, over the course of uh, your, your, your tenure here thus far. Um, but in addition to that, uh, I don't think that was a subcommittee meeting that had to do with 10455 Torrey Avenue with Director Morley and Susan, which we uh, have um, discussed earlier this evening. And so, um, no, I don't think I have subcommittee assignment report outs here uh, beyond that. And so let me look to our uh, hands on Zoom. The order will be Council Member Moore. Councilmember Willie, followed by Vice Mayor Chow. Councilmember Moore. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor Paul. So, as you know, Councilmember Willie and myself are on the City Hall uh, subcommittee. We met on October 13th to go over parking and space planning, and our next meeting will be on the uh, around the 27th, I believe. Um, but it is regarding funding and recommendations. So, so far. Uh, we've gone over structural analysis, the EOC, as we came to us um, earlier in this meeting um, this evening, and uh, we've talked about parking and programming. So the other subcommittee 
is the community grants subcommittee, which I'm on with the uh, vice mayor and um, the chair of the Parks and Rec committee and the vice chair. So it's the uh, chair, Mina Shu, and the vice chair, Sashi Bigur. And we met, uh, we've met twice. Um, we met on the 7th and the 17th of October and had a very robust discussion and we made some recommendations to modify the grant program which the parks and rec director sanders will be bringing back in a few weeks and i want to uh, again congratulate director sanders for the promotion um, we also recommend that sander i'm sorry um, we also recommend that council appoint that uh, the same subcommittee uh, is given the task of reviewing and making recommendations to the festival fee waiver policy and then bring those recommendations back before the next list of projects comes to council for approval and as we recall the um, the fee festival waivers are were approved within um, the budget so they uh, came to council back in June um, for approval so that is our, our recommendation and I can bring that up again in a future agenda items to have that happen all right thank you thank you council member moore next we have council member willie yeah hey i'll thank uh, councilman moore for that update on the uh, seismic upgrade i'll just add that earlier tonight we talked about the uh tory building m 455 which we're talking about moving the eoc out of city hall over to the tory building since we didn't have uh uh, the public uh, attending that earlier one, at least letting them know. And what that does for City Hall is it reduces the structural requirements for the seismic upgrade, and that means dollars and cents. Uh, you know, so great. But then I'll also do a, a quick one. That also frees up a lot of space now for our city manager <clears throat> to... Uh, work with uh, the layout and uh, the headcount for City Hall. So now we'll finish the City Hall uh, seismic upgrade and come back with a recommendation, hopefully at the uh, end of November, uh, and things are looking really good. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you again, Councilman Moore. Thank you, Councilmember Willie. Next we have Vice Mayor Chow. So I attended the mayor's commission meeting with commissioner this month. Um, so I attend, attend that by monthly. Commissioners all give the feedback that they really appreciate the staff liaison that they that's serving each commission, that they have been uh, really phenomenal um, in providing information for them. So thanks to uh, all the staff liaison for your service with, with the commissioners. And then um, I think we had two meetings of community grant sub subcommittee. We have um, a recommended a guideline that will be coming to the council and that subcommittee then will look at the festival guideline next. And I think um, there was a subcommittee request to form a subcommittee for the homeless issue that I would like to make that request. And uh, I think we have city plan to end homeless. What's the status of that? And I think we really need to look at city's own outreach team, like some other cities have. Um, maybe a subcommittee can first study the, these options. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Chow. And we will go on at this time to, and I see Councilmember Moore, your hand is still raised. Is that from uh, previous? Okay. Great, thanks very much. Item number seven is our city manager update. City manager, Wu. Thank you, Mayor Paul. Um, several updates. Um, the first one is a happy news and council member Moore actually stole my thunder. So I am pleased to announce um, that we officially promoted Rochelle Sander to the Parks and Recreation Department Director after an extensive and hard search. We think I, th I am confident that we found the right person. So please join me in welcoming Rochelle to the new capacity. And I couldn't get enough emails from the community thanking us and thanking her for her services. 
Um, following on that, um, Public Works uh, has several updates. Um, Public Works staff has been doing a number of outreach efforts uh, regarding three CIP projects. Um, first of all is the revitalizing Memorial Park project, and then the all-inclusive playground at Jellyman Park, and also the latest design option for the Lawrence Mitty Park and Trail. In addition to that, um, Public Works staff has been and will be begin to um, start the first phase of the annual pavement project on our streets. Um, so I ask public's patience and also your understanding if any traffic delay or inconvenience is caused by the lane closure or getting a better street out of this. Um, wanted to report out that the city's fraud, waste, and abuse hotline is now officially launched. Um, all city staff and city council, thank you for your time, has completed a training that's conducted by our internal auditor, Moss Adams, last week. Um, and also just to note that the Santa Clara County Registrar of Voters has begun mailing vote by mail ballots to all registered voters for the November 8th election. And the official ballot drop boxes are now officially located in front of City Hall as well as Quinlan Center. Um, in terms of the unhoused individual on portal, um, just wanted the community to know, to know that Mayor Paul and the city team will be discussing the matters and also just meeting with the concerned residents tomorrow. Um, and also just a few follow-ups from the previous meeting um, that the council asked to have the pre-approved ADU design vendors and also some homeless assistance program information to be posted on city's website and that has been done. And in regard to the home sharing program, I did confirm with the planning staff that that will be a program identified and also incorporated into the housing element. So uh, when the draft document is ready, council will have further consideration of these programs. I'll wrap up my uh, report for today. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, City Manager Wu. And um, I, I do see a hand raised, but typically we don't take comments or questions, unfortunately, Councilmember Moore, uh, for the City Manager update uh, in the interest of uh, the summary of time. But of course, there's offline uh, communication uh, if you wanted to follow up on a, a point of inquiry. Item number eight is a department update. And so that was something that I had implemented earlier this year with regard to giving the public a sense of what's going on in the various departments in the city. And uh, city manager Wu, when you um, uh, arrived, uh, you have, uh, I think to really uh, good effect, added a few other of the uh, divisions um, in, in the city. Uh, we've had the economic development uh, manager, and now I believe today you would like to provide an update or have someone from staff provide an update on the city manager's office. And Thank so, you, Mayor Paul. Um, so I took the liberty of expanding that uh, department updates to not just on focusing on the five departments that you um, are usually encountered with, but also city manager's office has many, many different functions. So today I would like to have Astrid providing the council and also members of public an overview of what a city manager's office do. Astrid, take it away. Good evening, honorable mayor and council members. Um, I'm Astrid Robles, the acting assistant to the city manager, and I will be presenting the department update on the city manager's office, and we'll also go over some of the items I am currently working on. So I will share my screen. Great. So to start things off, uh, here's the current organizational chart for the city manager's office. This includes all full-time employees and shows the current vacancies as well. As many of you know, we have had a lot of turnover this past year, which has been challenging, but the divisions continue to work on their many projects on a regular basis. We are currently recruiting for some of these positions, including the legislative aid, which was approved by council during the budget adoption process. Uh, next, I will be giving a brief overview of each division, starting with the city clerk office. The clerk's office is responsible for maintaining city records and serves as the compliance officer for federal, state, and local statutes, including the Political Reform Act, the Brown Act, and the Public Records Act. The city clerk also oversees all election proceedings, including helping candidates meet qualifications and overseeing campaign finance reporting. With the elections right around the corner, they will be very, very busy with this for the coming week. Additionally, they work on a variety of programs listed here including onboarding commission and committee members, registering lobbyists, and preparing and overseeing all council, commission, and committee agendas. 
Next, we have the sustainability division who recently completed the update to the climate action plan on August 16th, 2022. Apologies for the typo here. The climate action plan serves as a roadmap for the division activities and they're currently work underway with implementing actions from the climate action plan 2.0 including an ordinance establishing a streamlined permit process for EV charging stations, a partnership with CDD that is up for a second reading later tonight, actually. The sustainability division also supports a variety of projects with public work, incorporating sustainability features into construction projects. The division is also responsible for a number of community-facing programs related to drought, Earth and Arbor Day Festival and community engagement. Uh, next, we have the Emergency Management Division, who is responsible for emergency operations and planning, which includes response coordination, planning, and training for all hazards. They coordinate the Block Leader Program and work with other volunteer organizations who are part of the Citizen Corps Program. Uh, this year, they have provided nine personal emergency preparedness trainings for city residents and volunteers, and have provided emergency preparedness guides in six different languages that are posted on the city website. The division also has worked with both school districts in Cupertino to plan for a coordinated response to school safety or security incidents. Additionally, they will be having their annual public safety forum next week on October 26th, uh, which is in coordination with the Public Safety Commission. And next we have the Office of Communications, which is actually made up of two divisions, communications and video. Their mission is to give Cupertino residents access to timely engaging and important information. They reach out to and communicate with residents, businesses, and community members daily through various platforms, including the scene, items of interest, press releases, email notifications, social media, the city channel, promotional videos, and the Engage Cupertino website, just to name a few. They also facilitate and execute various city events, such as the Cupertino Library Expansion Gala and Ribbon Cutting, the Crest Awards Ceremony, and also support other divisions event, division events, such as the Public Safety Forum and the Earth and Arbor Day Festival. Internally, they also support all city divisions and departments by helping develop outreach and marketing plans for specific policies, policies or programs. And also they provide video and Zoom support for all city council meetings and commission and committee meetings. Next, we have economic development, which I will briefly touch on since Tina gave uh, such a wonderful presentation on her division at the last meeting. She is a strong advocate for the business community and continues to work on expanding city's outreach efforts through surveys, her CBOP program, and the Business Connect newsletter. We look forward to seeing her bring forward uh, these upcoming initiatives, including the online Cupertino store and the Economic Development Committee. Lastly, we have the administrative branch of the city manager's office, which is currently made up of our city manager, an executive assistant, and myself. I work on facilitating the city work program process from its beginning stages to its adoption, then all the way through the year with quarterly updates. I also work on the city's legislative affairs, which includes working with the legislative review committee and our state lobbyists to take positions on state legislation and review the legislative platform. Additionally, I tackle certain policies and procedures like the adoption of the no smoking ordinance from last year to the update of the commissioner's handbook. This year, I am working on bringing in an update on the smoking ordinance and on developing the safe gun storage ordinance, which is part of the fiscal year 22-23 city work program. As part of my presentation this evening, I also wanted to briefly mention that the city work program dashboard is currently updated with information beginning from fourth quarter of fiscal year 21-22. The dashboard can be viewed at cupertino.org slash city work program. I will also be providing council with a memo that wraps up the fiscal year 21-22 city work program by next week that will also be published on the city work program website. Here's a little snapshot of the uh, status of city work program items from the last fiscal year. As you can see, we have completed 15 items while others are still pending, but the majority of items are multi-year and will continue to be worked on during this fiscal year. One of the other projects I'm currently working on from the fiscal year 22-23 city work program is a student internship program. This is a program that the mayor piloted this summer where four high school interns participated and volunteered at many city events, including the Mayor's Cup Challenge, the Angel Island Excursion, and the Library Expansion, just to name a few. I will be bringing a report to council with details of the pilot summer program, uh, summer internship program at the next uh, November 1st city council meeting. 
And that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Great, thanks very much, Astrid. Um, so this is a question for our city attorney, Chris. We have a blue card from the public asking to speak on the city manager's report. However, that's not our, our typical practice. And so are there uh, legal uh, requirements that are involved here? Uh, no, this, it's the, the city manager's report that was not, uh, and their items discussed during the report are not agendized items. Um, they can't, there is an opportunity to address those issues during oral communications. Um, so there's, there is, legally speaking, there is not a requirement that we um, reopen oral communications at this time. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, to our member of the public on this one, I'm getting a thumbs up, but uh, if, you know, the hour is young at the end of the night, uh, we do have an item in oral communications. And so uh, please feel free to um, remind us at that time and we'll open that up for that uh, availability. So uh, thanks very much for your understanding. Um, and thank you, uh, Mr. City Attorney, uh, for that clarification. We are on to our consent calendar. These are items nine through 14 and reminding the public that under um, postponements and orders of the day, uh, there was a motion uh, that was uh, passed to go ahead and move item 17 over to the consent calendar as well. And so uh, here's an opportunity for, um, you know, any requests to remove items from the consent calendar from my uh, fellow council members or um, following that, uh, we will go ahead and uh, take omnibus comments if there are any uh, people that would like to speak on any of the items on consent, uh, but uh, it is not pulled. And so let me, let me go by hands, and I do see a hand raised from Vice Mayor Chow. Um, and well, actually, before I go to Vice Mayor Chow, let me go to our city clerk, uh, because I believe, Madam City Clerk, there was a request from a member of the public, is that correct, to pull an item off of the consent calendar? Yes, Mayor, we received an email from Annie Yang uh, from the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society to pull item 14 regarding item 14. the golf course maintenance contract. Okay, so advised. And so let's go to Vice Mayor Chow at this time. Vice Mayor Chow, did you want to speak to any of the items on consent uh, as a request to pull the item? Uh, your, your microphone, please. That was what I was going to pull because I, re I received a comment about the, uh, this contract that, yeah, I would like the to The request discuss. for item 14? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, vice uh, I think we, yes. since we placed an item that wasn't on the consent to the consent agenda, I think we need to inform the public who would like to speak on that item what's their process. I think they can still comment as part of this big consent agenda. That's correct. So, so, so let, let me go ahead clarify and clarify that yes. because we covered that last time, okay. but didn't really mention that. Okay, let's, uh, let, let's clarify that at this point. So uh, within the rules of procedure, we're allowed to put items that are on the regular agenda, as long as it's not a hearing or an ordinance item uh, onto the consent. That was done for item number 17. And so let me go ahead uh, and uh, Vice Mayor Chow makes an excellent point. The subject is the consideration of reviewing crosswalk options across Rodriguez Avenue in the vicinity of the public pedestrian walkway easement through track 9405, also known as the Campo de Lozano subdivision. Sorry. Um, and uh, the other is the review of the proposed language for signage to be posted. And so I just wanna remind the members of the public that if you wanna speak on this item and it's not pulled off of the consent calendar, we have an opportunity to speak to consent generally and I, I hear my city attorney clearing his throat yeah, and uh, excuse, excuse I, I think Chris wants to speak on this yeah um, I, I mean if the issue if I understand the the concern correct correctly it's that it's that item number 17 um, uh, there wasn't an opportunity to comment on it but I believe the postponements and orders of the day are before um, oral communications so there has been an opportunity to comment on it Okay, with regard to, but it is on the consent calendar, however, right? Correct, yes. Okay, so, so if someone wants to speak to it uh, as, as a general item on consent calendar, that's that, an opportunity as well? That's correct, yes. Okay, Thanks. Okay. great. Well, thank you for that uh, clarification and reminder, um, uh, City Attorney Jensen. And so uh, we'll go ahead and uh, have item 14 off the consent. I will now invite any public comment on uh, any item that is on consent that has not been taken off. And so just to remind everyone, that is 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 17, because 17 has been added to consent. Um, and 14 has been taken off, and so that will be considered in due order. Uh, are there any members of the public that would like to speak to any of those items that are on the consent calendar? Uh, and again, that's 9 through 13, 
and 17, I see a hand raised uh, in, uh, the, uh, uh, in the chambers, and I also see a hand raised on Zoom. So uh, Seema Linskog, your hand is raised on Zoom. I'll remind the members of the public that if you um, uh, raise your hand on Zoom or if you hand in a blue card, by the time that the first person is done speaking, then uh, we will call on you. I, I have the blue card from the member of the public here. Uh, so now we have uh, two uh, members of the public on Zoom, Seema, as well as uh, Irve Marcy, and uh, Jennifer Sheeran has a blue card in, uh, in the council chambers. And so, uh, Seema, welcome. You'll have three minutes. Oh, and I'll also remind our members of the public, if you want to have three minutes, or up to three minutes, rather, of your comments read into the record by the city clerk, please email cityclerk at cupertino.org uh, during this time that the first uh, person is speaking. Welcome, Seema. You'll have three minutes. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, you're loud and clear. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, council members uh, wanted to comment on agenda item 17 on the consent calendar. Um, to, we have uh, been speaking to a lot of residents on Rodriguez and um, in Biltmore apartments, as well as um, the condominiums at Waterfall. And um, they have re reiterated to us that they would like to see uh, data collected by the city before any decision is made on whether to put in a crosswalk and where to put the crosswalk. Uh, or whether a crosswalk is needed at all. And if a crosswalk is needed, uh, which of the three options is the best option for it? Um, the consensus seems to be also that the signage that the city has proposed um, meets everyone's needs. So we, uh, we support that signage, um, but we would like to ensure that the city does go ahead and wait a year and collect data from the time that the Rigna Creek Trail opens and the access path uh, starts getting used. Um, that we collect a year's worth of data to uh, understand if there is a need for a crosswalk and if so, at what location. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Seema. Our next speaker is Irve Marcy. Welcome, Irve. And welcome. Um, Irve Marcy, you'll need to unmute your microphone to speak. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, I would like to uh, second Sima's comment on item number 17. Um, I think it's important for us to understand um, in terms of usage, getting uh, gather some data around the usage of the walkway to Lozano, Lozano Lane. Um, I think th this walkway is going to be very important for all the residents of uh, the Biltmore complex like myself uh, for um, our kids to go to school at Eton Elementary. I think um, our uh, dir the director of Eton Elementary mentioned herself that she would like to see a uh, pedestrian bus to be organized for the kids to go to school safely and I think that uh, this this walkway and the cross uh, crosswalks would be very important for that and uh, getting some more data you know to make that happen would be would be important thank you okay thank you Arve. and we are to our blue cards now uh, madam city clerk were there any further blue cards during this time or were there any um people that emailed you at the city uh, clerk at cupertino.org account no mayor okay uh thanks very much so we have Jennifer Sheeran from the public. Welcome, Jennifer. Or I should say live from the public in the council chambers. Welcome. Finally. It's been a long time. <laughs> so um, thank you for continuing this item and allowing all of us a chance to speak on it, because obviously it was 11.50 at night when it came up the last time. And um, also thank you to the city attorney and city manager's office for having um, allowed that to happen and for the council members to listen to our city attorney to make sure that we're following all the procedures and doing the right thing. Um, one thing I'd like to say, in addition to what Seema and Hervé said, is I think we should trust our staff. Um, the staff are civil engineers, many of them are professional engineers, and as an electrical engineer myself, I know how much training goes into that, and so therefore I trust them on matters when it comes to 
you know, should we get data? Should we do things? Um, and so therefore, to me, I think that it's worthwhile to actually listen to them. Um, I also think that the side that they propose is a good idea with one caveat, which is it currently says um, walk your bikes on the trail, and but it doesn't make any note the fact that that pedestrian trail, which is always walked on, not biked on, connects to another trail that you are allowed to bike on. So that would be the only thing that I would, I would mention regarding the sign. But I think, um, and I hopefully you agree with me, that um, waiting a year to see what happens is the right thing to do, and it's, the, it's what the staff recommends, and I, and I support that. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, that does it for the uh, comments on the consent calendar. And so I'll go ahead and ask for a motion from one of my colleagues for consent items 9 through 13, as well as 17. Councilmember Moore, your hand is raised. So moved. Councilmember Moore moves the recommended actions on those items. And Councilmember Way, would you like to second? Yes, I second. Okay, there is a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, I see a f uh, continued hands raised from council members Way and Moore. Mm -hmm. And did you want to, did either of you want to speak on this? Um, um, and so I don't see. I did want to make one brief comment. Okay, so council member Moore wishes to uh, make a comment on the motion on the table. Okay, so the reason I requested that item 17 be put onto consent was because it was a very thorough uh, staff report and the recommended action was acceptable and we appear to have all agreed on that um, so I I really appreciate that and we this happened in the last meeting as well um, so just uh, keep it up thanks great thank you council member Moore um, I echo that sentiment I think that we're um, producing really good results here and so you know, um, if we're front-ending a lot of this work, uh, a lot of these uh, sentiments uh, that we have positive things uh, come about as a result of a lot of the, you know, later, um, you know, night, all the, all the cutting off at midnight uh, types of deliberations that we've had. So, um, yeah, very, very grateful for all of my colleagues and um, staff's work on, on these items. So I see Vice Mayor Chow has a hand raised. Did you uh, care to provide some uh, commentary on the motion on the table? Um, sure. So I think it's a good thing that we, this, I think the staff um, recommendation is very thoughtful that we observe three locations in the next year so we n know the traffic. But I think it's a good thing that we, this, this was brought to our attention because otherwise we wouldn't know. Um, many people will be crossing that street dangerously. And now we, at least it's something that we are watching out for and studying for. So I think it's important when residents bring a concern, we don't ignore, we address them to, to evaluate whether there's something we should do or not. Um, so this is an example of that. And yeah, so. I'm looking forward to the trail to be open, but I think people do need to be concerned that, okay, it is public right of way, but it's, it is on private property. Just like Regnaut Creek Trail, it is on Water Valley property. So we should respect the property owners when we use their property for our public benefits. Um, so we thank them for providing the public right of way, but we should not take it for granted. When it's a public right of way, I think public agencies should be appreciative of uh, on our use of their private property. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor Chow. And I don't see any further hands raised at this time. And so let us go to our city clerk to take a roll call vote for the motion that's on the dais. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Way? Aye. Councilmember Willie? Aye. Vice Mayor Chow? Aye. Mayor Paul? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Madam City Clerk. We're on to item number 14. And so that was pulled off of consent. Item number 14 is um, to consider the award and authorization uh, to the city manager to execute a maintenance services contract with professional turf management. 
Uh, that's the name of the uh, NND Professional Turf Management for the Blackberry Farm Golf Course. Madam City Manager, would you care to uh, introduce the item or to introduce the staff member who can uh, provide some commentary? Although, you know, before we go to you, Madam City Manager, um, I think that the member of the public who actually requested this be pulled um, was uh, emailing the council, and so I don't necessarily see that member of the public here. Um, oh, Annie Yang actually is here. So, so Annie, um, very briefly, if you could uh, encapsulate the purpose of your request. I know Vice Mayor Chow took up uh, and indicated that you had uh, provided an email. But before we uh, bring this to staff uh, to help frame uh, the staff uh, feedback and commentary of the presentation, if you will, uh, we'd like to give you an opportunity to uh, explicate uh, your purpose for pulling or requesting the item be pulled. So welcome, Annie. Uh, good evening, Mayor Paul, Vice Mayor Chow, and Council Members. Thank you for um, considering this item. My name is Annie Yang, and I am the chair of the Environmental Action Committee of the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, and I'm also a resident of Cupertino. Uh, we noticed that in the new contract's technical specifications, um, they don't include many of the wildlife protection provisions that were in the 2016 contract. We understand that the council is yet to decide the future of Blackberry Farm Golf Course, um, but regardless of the future decision, uh, the new maintenance contract should include protections for existing wildlife and for Stevens Creek, which is adjacent to the golf course. Um, we detailed the specific sections that were left out of the current contract in a letter to the council that you uh, mentioned, and we included our recommendations to enhance those sections as well. We included a table within that letter that compared the two documents along with our recommendations, and we hope you can reference that table if you can. So in summary, um, first, the 2016 document includes specific actions that would ensure compliance with state regulations and protect terrestrial and aquatic life. These are left out of the 2022 document. For example, the 2016 document denotes best practices for protecting birds during nesting season, requiring minimal use of outdoor lighting, and ways to avoid chemical runoff. These sections should be added back. Um, second, the surveys for nesting birds, um, they, should be uh, they should be required prior to any tree trimming for any trees on the golf course during nesting season. Third, the section on protection of aquatic life should be retained and updated with the state's recommendations on inappropriate pesticides, as well as, spe as, well as specific practices that protect the creek. And finally, while both documents prohibit chemical, pesticide, or fertilizer runoff, neither require monitoring nor testing. Uh, this should be required to ensure runoff actually does not occur in this sensitive area. We hope you add these protections back into the contract. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Annie. And just to signpost the order here, we'll go to staff uh, with a presentation at this time. We will then open it up to the members of the public. Uh, for the normal commentary period, and then we'll bring it back to council. And so, uh, City Manager Wu, it's your turn. Thank you, Mayor Paul. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a presentation, but I do have a response back to the um, the Audubon Society. So it is staff's oversight for not including this provision. Um, my understanding is that because of staffing overturn since 2016, for some reason, this um, section of the RFP was omitted. Um, so I've been informed that if council would consider making a motion to include a provision to ensure compliance with wildlife and water quality protection best practices as reflected in the Audubon Society's comment into the motion um, for approving a contract and staff's in full support of that. Um, I do have uh, my new director, Rochelle Sander, online to answer any further questions, but we do not anticipate to have a presentation for this item. Okay, uh, let's go to our members of the public. Uh, as I delineated, uh, we have Louise Sadati as well as Annie Yang uh, with hands raised. Uh, Madam City Clerk, are there any blue cards on this item live? No, Mayor. Okay, and so I'll remind our members of the public that you'll have uh, the time that the first person is speaking, or three minutes, whatever's longer, uh, to raise your hand on Zoom, to hand in a blue card live, or to uh, send an email to City Clerk, all one word, at cupertino.org to have up to three minutes of your commentary read into the record. And so, Louise Sadati, welcome. You'll have three minutes. Louise, you'll need to unmute your microphone if uh, you wanted to speak on this item number 14. O 
Okay. Hi, sorry, I did not mean to speak on this item. Oh, I you meant did not. to speak on the previous item. And there was only, uh, I thought the previous item was going to be item 17. And, um, and then suddenly there was only a two minute window for people to try to get their hand up to um, speak. In the future, if there's suddenly a change in the agenda order, uh, can the public be given more of a notice that there's been a change in the order? and Or uh, can there be at least like a, a five minute uh, interval for those of us in the public who were startled by the sudden change in agenda? Uh, uh, order okay, to Louise, um, uh, get their hand up. Thank you very much. Yeah. Your, your point's uh, taken and noted, and uh, we'll go ahead and um, uh, bring this back. Uh, I don't see any further, uh, and, and I promise to, to follow up, um, but with regard to this item number 14, um, I'll go ahead and wait the couple of minutes as well um, while we're bringing it uh, back up to the dais. I don't see uh, further unique hands raised here, um, and so Madam City Clerk, I'll check back in with you in a couple of minutes uh, with regard to further hands raised, uh, or I should say blue cards or, or emails to the city uh, clerk uh, email address. So um, we do have two um, members of council uh, that would like to speak on this or to follow up with questions, I should say. Council Member Moore followed by Council Member Woolley. Council Member Moore. Okay, um, thank you, Mayor Paul. So. I would like to hear the, the language that's suggested for the, the motion uh, regarding compliance with uh, the wildlife. I believe that they were ordinances, so I'd, I would like to hear that. Um, but I had uh, some questions on this item, which I think they, it could be followed up with, with just a memo. Um, and that's regarding some resolutions I found on PDF pages 996 and 997. And I can give you those um, resolution numbers. They're from... Uh, 2010, I believe, but it was 10-049-050, uh, 050, 050, 052, 054, 055, and those were all regarding um, those were all regarding water rights and um, the uh, water water rights being given to the city and where they could pump water. So I would like to hear more about those water rights and if there's. Um, so if, if we have some right to have uh, a well or something on the on the Blackberry Farm golf course for irrigation, uh, perhaps. I'm just kind of curious what happened to these um, since I haven't um, seen this lately. And so that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Council Member Moore. Let's go on. Uh, and did anyone from staff want to speak to Council Member Moore's comment or observations? Um, I will speak to the recommended um, provision to the recommendation is to include, basically to include additional provision to ensure compliance with wildlife and water quality protection best practices uh, in response to the Audubon Society's comments. Um, we could include that in your motion or you could do a, a generic motion and we'll come back to you, council to, to make sure that you're comfortable with the recommended motion. Okay, having no motion on the table yet, we'll go ahead and take that under advisement. And Madam City Clerk, I'll check back in with you now that it's a couple of minutes later. Um, are there any further uh, comments from the public, either in the format of a blue card um, or an email? No, Mayor, we've received nothing. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I, I did see a member of the public actually drop off a blue card a moment ago, so I'm just wondering if that perhaps was for this item here. Um, no? Okay. Well, maybe I just... Um, tricks of the eye. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Madam City Clerk. I apologize for, um, of, uh, for, for seeing that incorrectly. So um, let's go to uh, Council Member Willie, followed by Vice Mayor Chow. Council Member Willie. Yeah, so uh, I agree with what we've heard uh, from, you know, the public and the city manager. I would toss out, though, that uh, we use the language in the previous contract. You know, I always try and minimize options for confusion. And if we give staff direction that, you know, adhere to what the public comments were, it, it possibly leads to different language in the contract. And now the contractor has to go back and somewhat worry about, you know, what it's going to cost him and 
and the, it's only language, but if we just adhere to the language in the previous contract, as long as the public didn't see any problem with it, then I think we make it much easier for the contractor where he says, bingo, I know what, I know what my costs are and here's the result. So I would just toss that out as hopefully trying to make this a little bit easier. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Woolley. Next, we have Vice Mayor Chow. And your mic. Okay. Okay. So, um, I wonder. So, the current contract expires on December thirty first. So, if we continue uh, continue the item, so the staff can bring back a revision is. Uh, do we have sufficient time? This is RFP, it's not a contract, so. <clears throat> so um, I, I would recommend that, counts, that that if council wants to move forward with this contract, and, and, and we do need a contract in place to do maintenance, that council authorize staff to um, discuss, you know, discuss this issue with the, um, the successful party in the RFP and reach an um, agreement with terms that's consistent with policy council's policy direction, um, rather than um, coming back and, and bringing specific language for council review, which um, you know it really isn't the role of the council. So um, I, I would recommend that um, that that council uh, give this direction and. Um, it could certainly incorporate um, council member Willie's thoughts to 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 consider um, what was used in the the um, prior agreement as well. But I, I think that's going to be more efficient, and um, it create it will reduce the risk that we get in a situation where we don't um, have an agreement that we can uh, execute before this the current term of the contract runs out. So, um, so we. Because there are uh, Audubon Society's letter include uh, quite a lot of details, so uh, it's hard. Are we? Um, so I'm not sure. The city manager's recommendation seems to be including all of these, but that's a lot of them. So. So uh, we're we're um, fairly comfortable that we can. Um, incorporate those, those elements into the contract um, through sort of you know regular oversight and best practices and appropriate language in the contract that will cover cover those details um, you know um, you know obviously there are two parties to a contract so um, we'll have to discuss the, the you know this provision with PTM but they are currently conducting the maintenance and uh, uh, performing according to the standards that the Audubon Society provided, and so uh, we don't anticipate a problem there. But but we but we think we'll be able to address it fairly straightforwardly. Um, maybe I don't understand. This is a request for proposal. So basically, we are specifying what kind of services we need, and then here we will include uh, um, protecting nesting birds and these other requirements from 2016 to comply with state regulation, as they say, then suppose the multiple people will be on that? No, that, so that, that, proce that process has already happened. So, uh, so these, oh, these, so we already yeah, yeah. So these, these closed these, a bit. Right, that's correct. And so oh. these are, these are not, these would not be additional um, uh, uh, line item de deliverables under the contract. Um, these are just clarifications of performance standards. And as you alluded to, um, most of them are requirements of state, federal, or local law already. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it, it's really just clarifying those and making so sure that they're- So they are probably already doing it, and we are just clarifying in the contract that um, you are actually going to do it by the contract. Right. Well, yeah. Certainly. I mean, there's always going to be a require. There's going to be a requirement that they comply with the law. But there. But um, but there can be value in to, spe to spelling these kind of requirements out. And, and so, mm. you know, we do appreciate the input from Audubon Society and mm. in, in, in making sure that that's clear. Great. So, uh, what? How would the members of Audubon Society maybe be able to um, find out what's the final language? Would uh, that be? A, it won't be in a future council agenda. 
and no, maybe it, it's no, posted on the city website? No, it, it won't, but it will be available through the city website. As RFP, they can... Uh, the contract will be uh, on, uh, available on the city website. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Where on the city website is that available? Uh, it's through the public records function. Um, that's it's managed by the clerk's office. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. There, there, so there, there, there's 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 a there's there's a, 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 there's in addition to the ability to submit a public records request, there there's there's a public records um, tab on the city website, and so archived documents are available there, and um, those include um, contracts. Okay. Great. So that will be available to people that are simply navigating through that part of the web page available and searchable for any any member of the public that was interested correct okay excellent yeah I, I had a fundamental legal question as to how you get another party that's not here to you know basically you know get empowered by the council to to, to agree with our, our staff but I, I think in principle what we've described is, is workable you know and uh, mm -hmm. you know those provisions are being adhered to uh, you know of course thank Audubon Society and their representative Annie uh, for pointing that out um, and uh, I don't see further hands raised or new hands raised but Councilmember Moore your hand uh, is raised did you want to bring a motion on item 14 um, uh, actually um, when I was looking at the meeting minutes, which I referenced those resolutions from, they appear to just simply be very close in a previous meeting, and it um, you, you can you can look at them, but I don't necessarily think that they're related to the Blackberry Farm. I am curious about them because they are quick claim deeds for water rights to the city, um, but uh, I I think the Blackberry Farm water rights issue is is probably going to be separate from those resolutions. But I still want to know um, if they did at one point have a well and um, and then what happened to it. Okay, thank you. Great, uh, thanks very much. And uh, at, at this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, check in on our uh, other panelists here. Um, I'm not sure if uh, we still uh, have uh, Councilmember Willie on the on the Zoom meeting. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, if, uh, if it's okay with everyone, take, take a brief break, uh, three minutes, and I wanna make sure that uh, we do have the full council available for uh, if we bring forward a motion and um, you know, making sure, I, and I, just in the interest of full disclosure, Council Member Will was actually calling me a moment ago, and so I'm assuming that perhaps he's trying to notify us that he needs to log back in. So we'll take a quick three minute break. Uh, it's 8.45 on the clock. We'll start again prompt at 8.49. Thanks very much, we'll see you soon. And I see that uh, Council Member Willie is on camera, and so actually let me turn on my Zoom camera here. Um, and we are on item 14. Uh, we're continuing uh, the discussion. And at this point, I think that we've had uh, a couple of rounds of comments. So I will, uh, for the purposes of further discussion, uh, ask for a motion on this item 14. Would anyone like to bring one forward? I'll ask uh, Vice Mayor Chow. Would you like to, uh, in order to, uh, if you're desirous of further discussion, uh, bring forward the recommended action for item 14? Item, item, item. Okay, item 14. I need to do this. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would like to motion that we uh, move the staff recommendation with the direction to use the 2016 contract with the base so that since there is no reason to change them and uh, include uh, all the environmental protection measures from 2016 and uh, in addition add uh, the uh, comments from um, Annie Yan in her email and the comprehensive table that she provided um, so that we continue to protect the environment and the wildlife in the golf course area because whatever we decide to do with the area, we will continue to protect the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Chow. Would anyone like to second that motion? Council Member Moore, would you like to second? Um, okay. Uh, yes, I'd like to second it. I am looking at the technical provisions um, right now from uh, the Blackberry Farm golf course maintenance in 2016. So the, the email, um, from Annie uh, did have a footnote and she referenced the actual pages. It's a 
it's five pages long and um, it, it seems pretty reasonable there's I have, do have a question um, contractor shall meet with staff and representatives annually to review maintenance activities relative to these considerations those were the wildlife considerations um, and so they're supposed to meet with city representatives and, and they're encouraged to meet more frequently as needed to ensure compliance I'm wondering if that has been happening and um, what outcome those those meetings have been have um, have, what that uh, what the outcomes been um, but it it looks it looks very very reasonable um, but I I would actually like us to take a, a five minute break for for the attorney to look at them um, before we before we do this I, I just want to be sure so um, so I mean we, we have re viewed that um, and uh, I think that you know as I said earlier we will be able to uh, you know incorporate we, we, we are optimistic that we will be able to incorporate this direction into an agreement with um, with with uh, PTI um, PTI uh, okay and and through the mayor if there's anything here that because a certain amount of time has passed and perhaps some of the the requests may have changed um, due to uh, science um, advances. Uh, will you please give it a, a look over in, in case there's anything to, to that nature that perhaps we need to have some improvements. Um, I, I've been uh, concerned about um, what kind of fertilizer is used uh, for some time because of the, the creek being right adjacent to to the golf course, and you, I know we've all heard about golf courses being a potential source for contamination of the watershed. So if you could um, look at that with an eye towards uh, protecting the environment and make sure that we're doing the right thing, I'd appreciate that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Councilmember Moore. And um, City Manager Wu, you had your, did, did you want to make a comment on um, that? Or? Mayor Paul, I just want to follow up with uh, Council Member Moore that um, directors and the other staff confirmed that they have been regularly meeting with a con contractor to review um, the practice and update if, if necessary. Okay, and I did see uh, Director Sander with her uh, camera on a moment ago, and so I guess you've uh, relayed that, that uh, information over. And so, uh, Council Member Moore, your hand is still raised in Zoom, and did you want to uh, further comment at this time? You've um, seconded the motion that's on the table. Yes, so I, I did second it, and uh, I really appreciate um, getting that feedback and knowing that they are having those meetings. I think that's great. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks very much, and I will uh, go ahead and um, call the question for item 14. There's a motion and a second on the table. And so, Madam City Clerk, if you could please conduct a roll call vote on this motion. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Way? Aye. Council Member Willie? Aye. Vice Mayor Chow? Aye. Mayor Paul? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Madam City Clerk. Item number 15, under second reading of ordinances, is to consider the second reading of Municipal Code Amendment to establish a streamlined permitting process to electric vehicle charging stations in order to comply with state laws AB 1236 and AB 970. And so um, we do have the recommended action that's to uh, conduct the second reading of that ordinance and to enact it. Um, I'm assuming that there is no staff report, is that correct? Okay, uh, so there's no staff report. I see Council Member Moore, you still have your hand raised. Did you want to speak to this? Okay, well, let me go to, you did want to speak to this. Okay, so let, let, let me go to the members of the public first to see if anyone would like to speak on this before we um, ask the city clerk to conduct the second reading and entertain a motion uh, going once, going twice. I don't see members of the public with any hands raised in Zoom. And Madam City Clerk, uh, presumably given that there's nobody in the council chamber, there's no blue cards, is that correct? That's correct, Mayor. Okay, and no one has emailed you, is that also correct? Correct, Mayor. Uh, okay, we'll give people a little bit more time if they want to uh, go ahead and um, you know participate in that. But I'll go ahead and entertain a motion at this time. Um, Council Member Moore, you had your hand raised and you were indicating that you'd like to bring forward a motion on item 15. Okay. Uh, before you do that, let me ask the city clerk to uh, conduct the second reading of this ordinance 22-2244. This is the second reading and enactment of ordinance number 22-2244, an ordinance of the Cupertino City Council setting forth procedures for expediting permitting processing for electric vehicle charging stations. 
Okay, thank you very much, Madam City Clerk. And so, Council Member Moore, would you like to bring forward a motion? Okay. Um, I move that ordinance number 22-2244 be read by title only and that the city clerk's reading constitute the second reading thereof. And I move that ordinance number 22-2244 be enacted. Would anyone like to second Council Member Moore's omnibus motion for second reading and uh, enactment of this ordinance? And I see Council Member Willie has a hand raised. Council Member Willie, would you like to second? Yes, I would like to uh, second uh, going electric. Yep, I second. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Council Members Moore and Willie. I don't see further hands raised at this time, and so let's go back to our city clerk for a roll call vote. Madam City Clerk. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Way? Aye. Council Member Willie? Aye. Vice Mayor Chow? Aye. Mayor Paul? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. We are on to public hearings, and we have one public hearing item. That's item 16. That is a, or at least I should say, yes, we do have one public hearing item. That's an application for a tentative subdivision map and planning permits for the development of six single-family homes on the parcel located at 20860 McClellan Road. And there are the application numbers listed in our um, in our agenda along with the uh, name of the applicant uh, and, and owner. So um, APN number 359-20-030. And so um, I'll take this to our um, city manager. If you don't mind, I can go ahead and introduce the presenter directly. And that's listed as Pew Ghosh of our planning, or, or I should say the community development department and planning manager. And I also see Ben Fu is uh, available as well. Welcome Pew and Ben. Good evening, City Council. Uh, give me a moment to share my screen. I just want to make sure. I'm moving on. I'm, I'm hoping my screen is shared here. Um, again, the item tonight is uh, for a six lot subdivision and development of six homes on each of those lots. Um, the uh, location is 20860 McClellan Road, and the um, item was uh, originally the project was uh, a project was proposed in October 2021, uh, which included a rezoning application, including uh, the permits that are being um, heard by the city council tonight. Um, upon a review, staff um, found that uh, a mitigated negative declaration would be appropriate for processing of the environmental review for this pro for that project. Um, and that, uh, as such, a mitigated negative declaration was prepared. This was uh, presented to the Environmental Review Committee in May of 2022. Um, and the Environmental Review Committee recommended uh, that the MND was the appropriate document for that, that particular project. Uh, however, there was a caveat. They, they did they did direct um, additional soil testing prior to any planning commission hearings at that time. However, following that, the applicant uh, invoked their right under the Housing Accountability Act um, to pursue a um, a project that would be general plan compliant. Um, and essentially, that meant that a rezoning application would not be required uh, for that project. And, um, but as a voluntary measure, uh, he did agree to comply with the mitigation measures that had been identified in the MND. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, it did not need rezoning this particular project and the project was now eligible for an infill exemption under the uh, California uh, Environmental Quality Act. Uh, this project was then uh, heard by the Planning Commission at its September 13th meeting, and it recommended approval of the project on a 3-2 vote with um, Commissioners Kapil and Wong voting no. Um, just as background, uh, the site is located in the Jollyman neighborhood. Uh, in um, It's basically located about, uh, about a few hundred feet uh, southeast of the intersection of McClellan and Stelling. Um, the site is approximately 1.25 acres. Um, there is an existing single family home on it with a rather large um, storage shed located behind it that um, stores cars and boats, et cetera. Um, it is fronted by McClellan Road to the north of the site. There's also a private street known as Cherryland Drive located to the east of it. Um, so the access for each of those six units would be uh, uh, from Cherryland Drive and we'll go over that in just a minute. 
Um, the uses on the, uh, that surround the project include single family residences to the north, east, and south of varying zoning districts, um, ranging from R16 to uh, R110. And to the west, uh, there is a church use that is located, it is the Church of the Nazarene, I believe. Um, just in terms of project data, again, this is there's a tentative map. What that would involve is subdividing this uh, single uh, this lot into um, six lots. Um, there would be a private street that would be completed, a cul-de-sac that would be completed, which is the Fairyland Drive. There would be some um, on-street parking that would be provided on that private street. And there would also be a dedication along McClellan Road that is required for frontage improvements. In terms of uh, analysis, um, as I mentioned, uh, because of the Housing Accountability Act, a rezoning is not required for this particular site. And as a result, uh, upon an analysis, we found that the closest um, um, zoning district that would accommodate the kind of development that is proposed would be the R17.5, essentially. And so we evaluated the project based on the R17.5 standards, which essentially means that the minimum lot size for each of the lots would have to be uh, 7,500 square feet. In this case, the proposed project has lots that range from 9,615 to approximately um, 7,526. That's the smallest lot. In terms of lot width, the R17.5 zoning district requires lot widths of um, no less than 60 feet. In this case, the lot widths range from 69 feet down to 60 feet. Uh, the proposed FARs for each of the homes is, uh, is under 45%, which is the maximum that's allowed under R17.5. And the heights for each of the structures is also under 28 feet, uh, which is what the R17.5 zoning district uh, allows. In terms of traffic analysis, um, this is considered a small project because it generates less than 110 new trips per day, and it does not exceed the um, city's square footage thresholds for development. And so as a result, uh, there was um, it was um, screened out from BMT analysis. Um, the project complies with all the city's parking regulations, um, and, and I'll go over that in just a minute. Um, there are also, um, uh, thanks to the dedication um, that is being provided, there are going to be pedestrian bicycle improvements along McClellan Road. At the Planning Commission hearing, there were several public comments that were heard, including traffic impacts, um, uh, comments about on-street parking. There were some concerns about the ADU setbacks and layout. Um, there was also some support for housing in the area. Um, there were some concerns from the um, uh, property owners that currently live along Cherryland Drive. Um, they had some concerns about uh, shared ingress egress. Um, there are privacy impacts of a proposed balcony on lot six. This was also raised by one of the Cherryland uh, Drive um, property owners. That particular balcony on lot six is located to the front of that lot. Um, and a fence height for lot six. I believe that was uh, one of the uh, property owners to the rear. Um, in terms of site planning, uh, as I mentioned, there would be shared access at the bottom of your screen is uh, plan north is um, uh, really the west. So uh, Stelling runs to the um, uh, right of the screen here and to the south of the screen is Cherland Drive, the shared um, access on that private street that I mentioned earlier. So um, again, those are the six lots that would that are being proposed. Um, that I just wanted to go over the parking requirements for the project. Um, each of the homes is providing um, two uh, in garage parking spaces and three driveway spaces for a total of five on site parking spaces. And in addition to that, there are six on street parking spaces that are being provided. The code requires a total of six spaces per lot. Uh, which can be in, in some combination or in a, any combination, as long as two are in the garage and uh, two are on the driveway. Um, so with that, uh, they have met the uh, city's municipal code requirements. Uh, in terms of privacy protection, they are planting uh, privacy protection trees between each of those lots to provide um, uh, privacy uh, between the view from the view sheds of the second story windows and the balconies. Um, there, these are just the architectural um, renderings of uh, the buildings that are proposed. It's a modern style uh, with a lot of um, warm tones and uh, very square um, edges. Uh, this is a newer style that we are seeing more and more being developed in the city, uh, including within established neighborhoods. Um, there's noticing all the noticing that's required for the project has been completed. There was a site sign, there were legal ads and mailed notices. Um, in terms of public comments, 
Uh, we, we continue to receive comments from the neighbors along Cherryland Drive, including um, common private street obligations, um, you know, parking impacts, uh, they identified a finished floor elevation discrepancy, um, and then uh, which um, has been since resolved. And then um, uh, they, there was some concern about the garage locations. Um, they didn't want the garage doors to face um, the street. The proposed project uh, supports several general plan policies, including the ones that are listed here, including building design, attractive design, um, uh, the location of the buildings, um, relationship uh, to the site, um, lot sizes, including connections. So they are providing a support. Uh, they, uh, they are providing a project that supports several of the city's existing general plan goals and policies. Um, in terms of the Housing Accountability Act, um, there are uh, rules around that, and so as a result, um, a project that meets and complies with all of the city's objective standards and um, uh, goals, essentially, um, the only way that uh, the city could deny such a project would be if a finding was made that the development would have a specific adverse impact on public health and safety, unless it's disapproved, or also uh, unless it's approved, but with lower density, meaning if, if um, the council approved it instead, with six, instead of six units with five units, let's say. Um, also, that the, the another finding that needs to be made is that there is no feasible method to satisfactorily mitigate or avoid specific, the, the specific adverse impact other than by the disapproval or approval at a lower density. So those are the very specific findings that need to be made in order to disapprove or lower the density uh, of the proposed project. Um, again, this is um, just a reminder that um, you know, the city cannot require a rezoning because um, the project is consistent with the objective general plan standards and criteria, uh, criteria. but the only reason that it doesn't, um, that it might need a rezone is because the current zoning is inconsistent with the city's general plan designation. And I did want to point out that under the city's current general plan designation, this project can be developed with six units. As a result, this project does not require rezoning and it is consistent with the R17.5 zoning district standards. With that, um, the Planning Commission did recommend that the City Council find the actions exempt from CEQA, approve the tentative map application, and approve the two-story permits and the minor residential permits for the balconies. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much, Pew. I'll take this to members of the public at this point to uh, provide commentary. And so uh, let's uh, move to uh, the Zoom function before we uh, bring back to council for follow-up questions and deliberation. Uh, Jenny, you're the first person on Zoom, and I'll remind everyone that uh, at the time that uh, Jenny has concluded talking, or three minutes, uh, whichever is longer, please have your hand raised in Zoom to be recognized to speak on this item 16. And then you also have two other options. If you're uh, live here in the council chambers, you can fill out a blue card or you can email um, cityclerk at cupertino.org. That's all one word, city clerk, uh, during this time to uh, be recognized for public comment. Okay, so Jenny, you're still the uh, one and only hand raised in Zoom. And so welcome, you'll have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mayor Darcy. Hi, I'm Jennifer Griffin, and I did uh, follow this item as it went through Planning Commission and I believe ERC. Um, I just had a couple of comments. Um, I, I'm assuming it sounds like the city has tried very hard to make sure that the ADU issues are not falling exactly at four feet, that they're giving it a little bit more space. Um, I will admit that the public has been deluged with a great number of new ADU laws in the last three to four years. The governor signed at least, I believe, eight new ADU laws two weeks ago, eight weeks ago. You can understand that this is very, very difficult for the public to follow and understand what the current law is. I just had a question. I believe one of the new ADU laws does allow ADUs up to 20 feet high, if I'm not mistaken. It could have been 16, but I think it's 20 feet. Will a project like this, if those become law as of January, um, would someone be able to ask for a two-story ADU on a project like this come January? Um, 
I can understand it, this project is probably not going to hit the dirt shovel ready for another probably four months, but what we're coming into January, I, are we going to see a situation where you could have someone asking for a two story ADU at the back of properties, four feet from property lines under the power lines? Um, I, I hope that this project will be ready to go intact in the way that it is now. And we're not going to see ADUs that are going to be as high as the second story balconies. Um, we don't know. This is, this is virgin territory because the governor chose to sign these laws. Um, I, I think that it's very important that we try to make this project look and have the look and feel of a single family home residential area, uh, just because this is Cupertino. We, some of us may not agree with these new ADU laws, but they're in, these are new homes that are gonna be occupied and we need to make sure they have the look and feel of what is the standard in Cupertino. Um, the other thing is too, we want to make sure that these properties have street trees seconds. in the front like the rest of the homes and that the problem is that a lot of these homes are becoming so big that we're at 50 percent far other than that i'm sure that the city will make sure that this project goes through and do they thank you jenny that's um three minutes and so we will uh, go on i, I received a, a brief note here that the applicant is also here um is that is that carrie brown who is the applicant or is that somebody else, Madam City Clerk? Uh, oh, yeah. Mr. Banthrow, if I may, um, we do have, um, gosh, Kelly Snyder and Alok Damaretti here um, who are the applicants, and I believe they might have a presentation as well. I see, I see. And if uh, I may uh, make a side note, Mr. Mayor, I did want to let the council know that there is a desk item related to this project. It was one plan sheet that was provided as a desk item, it will replace uh, one of the grading plan uh, within the tentative map, within the application packet. I just wanted to point that out. Okay, uh, the desk item, was that delivered by email or was that delivered in hard copy? Um, the clerk would, I believe it, it came through on email for sure. Yes, uh, Mayor, it was sent to council earlier um, before the meeting and it's also been posted to the website for the public. Okay, good. Um, so let's go to our other member of the public with a hand raised in Zoom before we go to, let, let's finish out the, um, the, the comments here uh, from the public. Um, I, I apologize, I didn't realize that the applicant had a presentation, uh, but let, let's go ahead since we've started the, the public commentary uh, and, and finish that. So we, we have uh, Carrie Brown and Madam City Clerk, was there anything, well, again, the council chambers uh, is, is empty, so I'm assuming there are no blue cards, but were there any emails that came in uh, during this time? Uh, yes, Mayor, we have two uh, links provided from Councilmember Moore. Um, okay, um, uh, so I don't, I don't know whether those uh, will be read into the record, but I, I so guess we to, can. To, to, the request was to include um, the documents and the record on the item tonight. However, I do not believe the request was to show them to the public during the meeting. Well, I, I, I guess because the, so, so Council Member Moore, I understand you sent an email to the city clerk during this time, is that right? So, so are you wanting the links to be read into the record or I'm not, this I, is? I would like the, the linked material to be part of the record. To be yes. part of the record. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, we. I think that. Um, yeah, actually, part of the record. Um, so, may I speak to that or let you? you no, I just want to clarify on. this procedurally. Are you asking the city clerk to read up three minutes oh, of those links into the um, record? Yeah. Uh, yes. Actually, that would be great if uh, you would do okay. that. Uh, the title page of of each one. That would be great. You just the, the first to let uh, to let the public be aware of what they are. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, well, let me. Let me check in with the city attorney on this one. Okay, so 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 Chris, I've got a council member who has has emailed the city clerk with regard to a couple of links and right. I mean, I, I know that for oral communications, for instance, a council member is a member of the public and can speak on, on that. And so, with regard to this mechanism, I think to be consistent 
those should be read into the record uh, for up to three minutes. I'm not sure about both emails because they're coming from one person. So w what are your thoughts on this? Uh, so, so, so comments submitted to the, the clerk will be part of the record. Um, if, if Council Member Moore wants to read from the documents, she's welcome to do so when council deliberates. I suppose that, that would make sense. Okay, well, would that be an accommodation that's acceptable? I, I think you, you do have the right to you know, read during deliberation, and so that's a, that's a good point. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and relegate it to that, council member Moore, since that would be part of the record as well. So, um, Carrie Brown, uh, you are next. You'll have three minutes, welcome. Hi, it's actually Carl Brown. Oh, I, I'm, I'm um, sorry. My <laughs> eyes are going <laughs> as part of this uh, whole exercise. So welcome, welcome, <laughs> Carl. Well. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will be brief. Uh, first of all, thank you to the council members for considering this. Thank you for the planning commission uh, for going through all of the, uh, the applicants' work. Um, I know that there's a lot of material. Uh, I will say I am a resident of Cupertino. I'm currently a renter. Anything that can be done to increase the available housing supply and therefore uh, allow renters to uh, purchase homes um, is, is good for the city overall. Um, in this case, uh, I think it's especially good. The current lot is an eyesore. Um, having living nearby the uh, proposed site, um, there's essentially, it was a junkyard. Um, there is a shed on the site which is unattractive um, and I'm glad to see that work is being done to increase the housing supply, do so attractively. Um, and um, uh, so I'm in full support of this and uh, I recognize the change uh, is, is, is not always easy for people to understand or accept, but um, for someone like myself, this kind of change to make more housing available is certainly needed. Thank you and I'll yield the rest of my time back. Great, thank you very much, Carl. And so let's go back to our, um, our panelists here. There was an indication that a couple of members of um, the public who are, who are the applicant would like to provide a presentation. And so in your Zoom function, uh, if you could raise your hands um, and we'll go ahead and I think the typical amount of time we provide for applicant presentations is five minutes if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and so let me go ahead and ask Kelly here uh, Kelly, would, would five minutes be sufficient for your presentation? Yes, it is. Okay, that sounds good. Welcome. Thank you very much. Would you like me to share my screen, Mr. Mayor, or do yeah, you Yeah, I, I think you're able to do so um, in this function. So if that um, works or if the... Absolutely, just a... give me one second here and I'll turn it on. Just Okay, um, so Madam City Clerk indicates to me that it's actually 10 minutes that you have for the presentation per the flow chart that we have in our agenda. And so thank you very much, Madam City Clerk. And so um, take it away, Kelly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. I think I have to do it like this, and it might be a little bit small, but okay. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you, thank you very much to staff, to PO, to Pew for the um, uh, the presentation just a moment ago. I won't take more than five minutes. I assure you, it's been a pleasure to work with everybody. Thank you so much. Um, just a few quick items to note for the council to consider before they take a vote tonight, which is we wanted to really accent how thorough we've reviewed the project um, all through the different environmental and CEQA um, research. We've done a lot of community outreach. We have a lot of support from the neighborhood, including even people like Carl who call in and are really pleased to see us cleaning up this site. Um, this does have a lot of benefits for the city of Cupertino and for the neighborhood, um, in addition to cleaning up an eyesore. Um, and we did get a positive vote from Planning Commission. Um, as a reminder, as, as Ms. Ghosh said, we began this back in February of 2021. We've been at this for almost a year and a half now. Um, so it's been a very thorough process. 
a reminder also that every single um, every single third party consultant and best practices expert that you see on the screen right now was someone who represented the city's point of view and the public's point of view in that we have our own list of six or seven consultants and engineers and and you know bio resource experts too these are the ones that represented um, the the recommendation for approval on the city's behalf um, we've done a great deal of community outreach. We've had a number of private meetings. We've met with most of the direct adjacent property owners one on one more than once. Um, we've had a very good relationship with our church neighbors on the side. Um, we are still trying to um, trying to respond as quickly as we can to ongoing comments that occasionally come from our neighbors on Cherry Land. Um, we've definitely doing our best to um, to accommodate their requests. There are a few things that you may hear about later that uh, that we're simply complying with the law and complying with the city's obligations. And so we we think we've gotten the best possible project we have we can while still complying with all of the necessary conditions of approval that your public works and your streets and traffic have asked us to comply with. Um, we've had a number of public meetings. I won't um, ask you, I won't go over them all again. We do have our own website and we know through analytics that we've had a lot of people visiting. So we think the information has been abundant and has been thoroughly reviewed and vetted. Um, one way to, to demonstrate this is that we don't need any exceptions or variances. We're not asking for anything unusual. This, as your staff report says, complies in every possible way. So that's one of the ways we know uh, that we've done a pretty good job of listening to everybody because there's kind of um, not much left to look into. Um, of course, we're going to be paying all of our city obligation fees. We'll be contributing to the park in lieu, the school impact fees, all of our plan check fees, and contributing to your below market rate housing program. Um, we have responded, as I said, to all of our all of the concerns and questions that we've received on a day by day basis. And there's just uh, a couple of new ones um, that we can't do any more regarding our site plan, regarding the um, grade and some issues related to the to the grade. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you that um, I'm here to answer a few questions. Mr. Damaretti is also on the line to answer questions. We really appreciate you considering this tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I appreciate you staying within the stated time limit that you self-imposed as well. So let's take this back to council. And I will go by a show of hands with regard to uh, follow-up questions uh, from council of either staff or the applicant. Um, and I see council member Willie has a hand raised, council member Willie, followed by council member Moore. Yeah, so uh, very good presentations from both the applicant and the uh, and Pew. And it's always good to see some renderings, kind of be able to uh, try and visualize what we're talking about. <clears throat> so the few questions that I have, if uh, you can go back to the view, the plan view that showed the parking, and it was stated that there's two parking in the garage, three parking out front for each, and <clears throat> six on street. And when I was looking at that uh, rendering, it, in less it's not really showing things the way they are. Yeah, perfect. So, you know, I see the three arrows in front of three triangles in front of each of the residences. And if that's the three parking spaces, if when I look at the street and it shows that there are six uh, parking spaces on the street, if that's the size of a vehicle, okay, roughly, and then you put those in the spots in front of each of the uh, units, great. But then I don't see how um, the third spot gets access because it sure looks like there's trees in front of all three, all of the third spot. I, I can try to help answer that. Uh, the driveway is flared, sir. So it doesn't necessarily, uh, you can have a two car curb cut, but a three car driveway. And that is what is proposed in this case. So if the two primary spots are occupied, does that block the third car from getting in and out? Uh, potentially, yes. 
Okay. But that is something that the homeowner will have to manage. Right. And if you look at the ones that are parked on the street, again, using that those gray boxes to kind of represent the size of vehicles for the for the uh, four houses that are uh, adjacent to the street parking, uh, at least lot two, three, and possibly four, it sure looks like it's gonna be tough to get both of those uh, primary spot cars in there because you're kind of hitting the uh, uh, cars that are parked on the street. So I will say none of this is to scale. <laughs> At least those drop boxes okay. were drawn in by me. <laughs> so I was just trying to indicate where those parking spaces were, not necessarily uh, drawing the spaces to scale. Great. As long as as long as we just acknowledge that, you know, double check that, make sure. Yep. Uh, I'm sure the applicant wants to make sure that they don't wind up with, oh my gosh, what did we do? But, you know, it just seemed too obvious. So the sizes was, check out per the municipal yeah. code. So then uh, the next question is, you know, is that uh, Terry land already a private road for the existing other properties? Yes, it is. Cherry land drive ultimately after this is built out would provide access to nine homes. Well, but what I'm getting at though, is that the owner of this property, the applicant, the owner of this property, um, uh, has its street frontage. And I'm just looking at it from uh, the standpoint that the other property owner had, I think, dedicated that ferry land for access to his properties. Now, this property owner that is abutting that uh, private road is now going to take advantage of that private road. Is, is that a problem? Not from our perspective, it's actually a good problem from our perspective, because that means there are fewer dr driveway curb cuts onto McClellan. So there's fewer uh, impacts on the public street. But how about those other people? I mean, we have the same thing over off of Rodriguez, where, you know, property that belongs to uh, one entity is kind of being used by another entity. And so if that, if that Cherryland Road actually came out of the adjacent property's property, and then this property is going to use it. Again, this looks like a great project, but I want to be sure that uh, everybody is kept whole. Yes. So when the, that Cherryland development was developed, there was an ingress-egress easement already established on that to provide ingress-egress to this particular property that is developing now. So they went into that process knowing that they would be providing reciprocal ingress egress to the property to the west. Great. Okay. Yeah. I you know I just want to be sure I asked that. Next question is: I thought I heard you say something about they didn't want garage doors facing the street, but it from the the driveway parking, it sure looks like all the garage doors face the street. Yes, then the neighbor across the street, did, the neighbors across the street did not want the garage doors to face that way. However, that is the case in 99% of single family homes in Cupertino. Yeah, well, right, right. And so you're saying that's the case here. So that's one of the things then that wasn't able to be mitigated. Well, it, it would be really hard to accommodate that because you would, if the garage is at a, um, if it's a side loading entrance, you do need a lot of backup space to yep. actually get out of that garage. And so yep. it would not have been uh, very feasible with the design. Then you won't have the living space close to the streets. So there's other general plan stuff yeah. that kind of mess gets messed up. Yeah. So it truly sounds reasonable. You know, it's just I want to be sure that I understood what was going on there. The last and final question is, you know, the planning uh, commission had a three to two to approve. Can you tell me what the hesitation was <clears throat> for the two that uh, did not uh, vote to approve? I just want to be sure that if there was something that we just need to be aware of and look at, maybe it was the uh, the uh, uh, garage doors facing the street or 
or maybe it was the upstairs balcony on the lot number six. I mean, what were the what were the uh, hesitations from two of the planning commission? Because those are our uh, our eyes. Right. I think um, one of the commissioners, I think maybe both the commissioners were uh, um, um, wanted additional uh, soil testing. Um, oh, okay. And they uh, they were a little disappointed that the project went the route uh, that it went, went through, basically. OK, so it wasn't something like the the uh, the impact of the poor, you know, the upstairs porch overlooking the neighbors uh, privacy protection using the same access road. Those are the things that, you know, I, I just want to be sure I don't miss something there that we had a uh, a duty to be aware right. of. So. There, there were no privacy concerns that were um, necessarily identified at the hearing. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's going to be a good project. I think both the uh, your PowerPoint and the applicants have done a really good job. The architecture looks really good, too. I, I you know, though, that is a very common uh architecture going forward very modernistic thank you thank you council member willie next we have council member moore all right um thank you and and maybe these are our questions for the attorney um when i so the the documents which i submitted are the um the uh, initial study the, which came to the Environmental Review Committee, the ISMND, and the uh, mitigation monitoring reporting um, documents. And um, to my recollection, these did not go to the, the, the Planning Commission, so they did not have them for review. So I, I'd like to hear and understand why they didn't. Um, so in the initial study, the appendices had um, appendixes, appendices A through E, um, and they included the geotechnical investigation and the phase one and limited phase two environmental site assessment. But in the reports which we have, um, and this is for the categorical exemption memorandum, we only have three appendices, the arborist reports, the air quality and greenhouse gas modeling results, and the preliminary stormwater analysis, and the geotechnical investigation and phase one and limited phase two environmental site assessments are removed. So we, we don't have those to, to look at. Okay, so um, they did do uh, the appendix uh, G checklist. Um, the CEQA checklist, and um, the, the, there was there there needed to be mitigation. So there, the, the contamination would be less than significant um, with uh, with mitigation. Um, so I guess I'm concerned that the that this that this um, body is has not been given the soils reports to to know about. Um, the contamination and why more soil testing had been requested. I also would like there to be a check on the um, the staff report about the um, the recommendations from the ERC because uh, we two of us on I serve on the ERC. Two of us had requested that there would be more soil testing and. Um, to my recollection, there were, were three who did not recommend and uh, recommended just simply that the MND was the appropriate document. So I'd, I'd like to know uh, what, I'd like to, to have the record checked on that. Um, so because the staff report is saying that uh, it was recommended to the Planning Commission that there would be uh, more soil testing. And, and that concern is um, how we get to having um, the, the, the CEQA bypass here with this categorical exemption with this the soil question out there and do we have enough um, information um, here for, for this approval. Um, so I, I, I'd like to understand all that. Um, this this is, has nothing to do with the project. It's got to, it's to understand this process of, of the 
CEQA exemption when there's um, when we you had a request for more soil testing it wasn't it, it was didn't happen um, and 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 this like I said this body um, hasn't been given the reports um, to know about uh, and, and that is troubling to me um, so I would like to understand why the reports weren't included um, for for all of us thank you okay thank you councilman Moore it sounded like a set of comments and questions directed to our city attorney mm -hmm. so Chris yeah I'll, I'll attempt to answer them so as you know, as Pew pointed out in her presentation, the applicant did initially come forward uh, and, and uh, had elected to go through um, and prepare an initial study to comply with CEQA. Uh, after uh, the ERC hearing, uh, the, the applicant reevaluated the project and, um, and uh, you know, uh, recognized that under the Housing Accountability Act, um, there was not a need for a rezoning, which is, would both, you know, eliminate that discretionary approval and open up the possibility of pursuing an in, pursuing an infill exemption uh, and, and so you know the requirements for documenting that infill exemption are different than the requirements for documenting the ism and d um, you know as you pointed out there are some um, impacts you have to look at traffic noise air quality and water quality uh, and those were evaluated in the infill exemption memorandum that was provided to the planning commission commission and and and, uh, and you know has also been provided to council. Um, there, um, there are other impacts that aren't evaluated for sites that qualify for the infill exemption memorandum and, and particularly with respect to um, you know hazardous materials, this site qualifies because it is not a site that is listed as a Cortese list, so-called Cortese list site under the health and safety code. So, um, so the, in, the, the infill um, exemption memorandum was provided because, it, it, you know, its staff's uh, recommendation and, and the planning commission's conclusion uh, that it, you know, it fully documents the requirements to, to qualify the, for, for the exemption, um, you know, and supports, you know, that decision by with substantial evidence, um, with respect to some of the um, the technical reports that um, were not provided, um, you know, to the extent that you know they're even relevant given the different standards, it's 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 not um, necessarily common practice to provide all of those technical reports to a a a, um, a a governing body or an advisory body like the planning commission in the course of making this decision. Um, um, you know, there is an expectation um, that you have the ability to rely on on, um, on your staff, um, on consultants um, to, to, to do that analysis. Um, all of those documents, um, you know, are in the record for this case, um, you know, and, and, you know, they certainly, um, you know, that, that whole history is part of the record. Uh, but, you know, that was the decision that, um, that staff made in presenting the information to both the planning commission and council and you know as i think um council member moore as you're very well aware there's a balance between providing all the information and having a, a very long um agenda packet you know so we're we're, we're trying to, to to do our best to balance those in interests so um if there's any part of your question that i didn't respond to i'm happy to take follow-up Well, I think f fairly simply, and I think the for the neighbors who live around that site, is the site clear for residential? And is there contamination that needs to be cleaned up? And how will they know about that? So so I, I would point out, um, you know, uh, they're, they're setting aside the fact that the applicant chose not to go down the ISMND process, the conditions of approval that were incorporated into the ISMND, the, the, excuse me, the mitigation measures that were incorporated into the ISMND um, will be conditions of approval for the, the, that project. And so that will require um, an appropriate level of oversight from uh, the County Department of Environmental Health, you know, and that, that will be determined based on the, the environmental, uh, environmental health review of the site. Through the mayor, so the the uh, project applicant is required by what aspect of this approval to apply for regulatory oversight for cleanup? Um, because I want to know how the neighbors will will know the um, uh, since the, it's not in these in in our 
um, agenda packet, how will they know the extent of contamination and whether or not, uh, if, if they want to read this, the reports um, from the county, how, how is that going to work out? Um, so, the, so, so the conditions of approval require um, um, a voluntary oversight from the county for the, uh, and to address you know, any environmental issues at the, on this site. Um, I think the degree of public process at the county would depend on sort of decisions that the county county environmental health makes, and I, I don't um, I, I don't have full knowledge of what that public process um, would look like or what those regulations are. Um, there is um, transparency through any site that's 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 um, accepted into the 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 voluntary oversight program because of you know their documents are available online. Through through GeoTracker, so there, there, that that provides a fair bit of transparency for um, soils and other reports that um, you know that um, are prepared for prop properties that participate in that program. I, I do not know um, what the details of the formal public participation requirement would be. Hmm. Through, through the mayor, um, where could you point to these conditions of approval? So I, I'll feel more comfortable if I can, can see that that's uh, just point to the page where it says that it, it's going to go to Santa Clara County DEH. Um, I, I'm getting there. Pew could probably get there faster than I, 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 I can. I can have it up. I, I can share my screen. Okay. But. That's that's what I'm looking for because I, I, I want to make sure that the, the neighbors have access to these documents, that they know that somebody's looking at it because we, we haven't spoken about the contamination on the site. And, uh, and we have seen a similar process happen before. Um, so I also want to make sure that we have disclosure on our website and, and, some, and a link so that people know how to get there because this we've we've had this happen before like I said I want to make sure that the the neighbors know how to get to get to geo tracker and know how to look up documents if they're concerned I don't want them to lose sleep at night um, that there that there is no regulator that they're not trying to self-regulate um, so the, I think those kinds of things are important and there we go Yep. Thank, thank you. Mayor, thank you I so much. Of course, and through the mayor, if I may, um, the Please. Cherry Land development also went through some soil cleanup themselves. Those three lots that were developed out to the east of the site, they had to have some significant, actually more soil cleanup than this particular case, I believe. So, it, and that happened through the county, Santa Clara County uh, Department of Environmental Health as well. Uh, sorry, sorry, Pew. When you were sharing, where were you in the packet? I can I can uh, state that that is in the draft resolution for the tentative map and it is on page seven of the 17 page PDF which is attachment a I believe okay it is uh, conditions number 13 and 14 got it okay great um, well thank you very much and I see councilmember Moore is still one more uh, indicating. Uh, th thank you, good. thank you, Mayor. So, are are these um, standard conditions, uh, or is this because it, I, I understand that when we get into these um, exemptions, that it, we're outside of the CEQA process, and it gets it, it feels pretty ambiguous. And as we saw before with with another project, that uh, it, it I'm glad that you have these conditions of approval, but we didn't have them um, previously for. Um, a, another large project in the in the city. So, um, anyway, if you could explain how that process worked, uh, or did we just get lucky that you put that condition in, or do we have something that automatically says it? Because I know we made some modifications to the municipal code regarding yes. environmental cleanup. Okay. I can go over that just briefly. Um, with regard to the particularly large project that you were referring to, we d we did not have adopted standards at the time that would require us to, or objective standards that would have ensured that we could have required that to happen. In this particular case, this project actually did precede our adoption of those standards that are now in place. However, the applicant voluntarily agreed to uh, adhere to the mitigation measures that were identified in the ISMD. So the language that you see in the resolution is actually from the mitigation measures from the ISMND. So if you compared uh, those two documents, you'll find language that's very similar. 
Um, now, moving forward, though, we do have an ordinance which applies automatically to every project that walks in the door for conditions of approval related to soil cleanup and such. So we do have that in place. Thank you, and thank you so much for the changes that were put into the municipal code uh, recently. And I, and I, I, it's really helpful. And I think moving forward, it'll put a lot of people to ease. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, okay. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Let, let me let me follow up on a quick question on this. Um, so I did pull this. This is superenumerated 1486 of our agenda packet and. I'm reading the last sentence in um, number 13 under hazards and hazardous materials, phase two recommendations. Uh, it reads that the applicant has complied with the recommendations shall be verified by the city of Cupertino Community Development Department and the Santa Clara County Environmental Health Department through their voluntary cleanup program prior to the issuance of the first grading and or building permit. So um, can someone tell me a little bit about the voluntary cleanup program of DEH, uh, because once you accede to it, then you're under the jurisdiction of DEH. Is that correct? Because I, I just I don't want there to be confusion uh, out in the public with regard to what is entailed uh, by the voluntary nature of that uh, of that title. Right. Yeah. So DEH doesn't actually like calling it the voluntary cleanup program because it doesn't it doesn't see the program as as once you commit to it, it does not see the program as voluntary. It's agreeing to it, it, it's it's a, an agreement to enter into DEH oversight. Um, and then once that agreement is executed, um, you know, DEH will review the site and will um, um, a, a, a approve um, any necessary remediation and a site management uh, plan to, to deal with contamination that might be identified during development. So, um, so it, it, it is voluntary in the sense that the, the applicant chooses to enter it, but once the applicant enters it, it imposes um, binding obligations on, on the applicant. Right. And so the language here definitively states that the applicant is acceding to this program. And so the voluntary nature of this uh, is not such that it reaches to a future point after this agreement is entered, such that the applicant can then say, this is voluntary, I don't have to participate in this. Is that correct? Um, I, I can also add on, Mayor Paul, that is correct. And also okay, the great. fact that the language is codified, well, not codified, included in the conditions of approval that requires the applicant to go through this process um, as part of the project. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I wanted to provide that, that comfort and a, a reading uh, because a lot of times you, you know, see these types of uh, language provisions and it's not immediately clear, clear to a lay person and you, you don't want to turn it into a situation where people are making you know, um, inappropriate or just clear outright wrong you know, interpretations of the language. So uh, greatly appreciate that and uh, let me go to Council Member Wei and um, followed by Vice Mayor Chow on our hands. So Council Member Wei, you're next. Okay, um, thank you, Mayor Paul. So I have two questions. Um, the question is, uh, one is from the owner, Homeowner Association of Cherrywood. I read their, um, you know, what they sent to us and I went to see the property and I actually talked with her. She's in Europe, but I, I did get in touch with her through line. And, um, so uh, apparently the owner homeowner association is talking about the little property that they have on this like two point a very narrow property property that they have to give in order for that property to put the lands together. So what she's concerning is because land worth a lot of money and she's trying to get the uh, owner to either donate some money to COSD or something. So I don't know what's going on, but I wonder the city probably should not be, maybe this is our attorney's uh, question, we should not be in between the two owners. Um, that's probably not we, what we should do. It, it, that's my first question. Oh, okay, Council Member Wei, um, let me refer this to our city attorney. Um, let's... <laughs> Chris? So, um, so I, I so I, I can um, I, I will defer to planning or, or public work staff on sort of you know the the, um, the process the city used to, to evaluate um, the um, the Im the improvements along um, either the private or the public right of way. I, I will respond to um, 
Council Member Way's question about CUSD is, is you know, there, but there would have to be some nexus between, um, you know, impacts on school and um, the property, you know, the, 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 um, the property we would be taking from this particular property owner. And if, if there's not any, 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 I, any impact on school that we'd be remedi remedying by taking this property, that, that wouldn't be a, a lawful um, use of the, the, the city's police power. Uh, yeah, that's good. So um, maybe you can answer the question about what, you know, she's very concerned that she's giving property for free. I think that's what she, her concern is. So, um, yes, Council Member Wei, when, when the project was originally developed, they did agree to provide reciprocal ingress egress access to the property to the west in order to facilitate such development. Now, in terms of their um, you know, in own private arrangements on who pays what, you know, we don't get involved in that matter necessarily. Um, and so uh, that is a civil matter that they need to work out between themselves. Um, uh, in terms of the design of the uh, the street and the improvements that are along McClellan, I can say that it has been reviewed by Public Works. They do meet the standards of the city. Um, you know, there are some flexible standards when there are private streets. Uh, there was a certain kind of um, orientation or not orientation but layout that w w that the property owner on the east had proposed for the property on the west but ultimately that was not how the the property on the west proposed it and it is acceptable to the city for how it is being proposed right now so there there is no con there are no concerns from public works in terms of the development as proposed okay so as far as i can understand it's between the two property owners to resolve um whatever they feel that they need to resolve correct Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is, and I also did meet the uh, property owner uh, yesterday morning at the property because I want to understand what's the issue and what, you know, where is there, where, where's where. So when I were, we were checking, I did ask him, why are you not in our housing element? Uh, I think um, he sort of has this, I don't know if he's in line, he has this intention that he's willing to be in the housing element, but at the same time, he wants this pro project to go through. So he has choices. What, what, what so I told him, I, I, as far as I understand, if you, you know, housing element, um, you know, we, we set a minimum uh, density and you have to meet that minimum density. So can you maybe inform him or inform us what is an owner's choice? He's in this process, but he also maybe are interested in being in the housing element. What, what would he, his correct course should be? So, um, you know, when we kind of evaluated the situation, we talked to our housing co uh, our consultant. Um, basically, the point was that you can't be a pipeline project and a housing element site at the same time. So you got to choose whether you're going to be one or the other. And um, so that that was and, and the property owner was very um, uh, gung ho about moving forward with this particular project and he wanted to get the hearings as soon as possible. So which is where we are right now. Uh, once this project gets approved, uh, if the council were to increase the density on the site, this project would become a legal non-conforming project if the property owner then chooses to go through with this project rather than develop at a minimum density of, um, uh, you know, whatever the council picks. So um, that, that would create some sort of an inconsistency within um, the city's general plan, essentially. So, um, uh, yeah, and, and the property owner would have that option for two years. You know, the city might rely on that site as at a certain higher density potentially for a higher yield. But then if the property owner chose this path forward because this, this tentative map approval will be good for two years or, you know, and then uh, any number of years if the state ex chooses to extend that deadline, then, um, you know, th he has a long-term uh, period of time where he gets to pick which option he goes for. Uh, let me let me call on our uh, city attorney. And I do know that uh, a couple of hands were raised from the applicant. Uh, so we'll uh, go there after, after Chris. So Chris, did you want to speak to any of the commentary that's been raised? Uh, I would just only note that, uh, that un under H HCD's guidance uh, for the housing element, it's, you know, it's ju it's consistent with that guidance to te to treat a, a, a project that's been um, you know proposed or entitled as uh, b developed at the density that's proposed or entitled as you know as opposed to you know a hypothetical zone density and I believe that's what the city has done for this project uh, this property in in the housing element so um, certainly I think the treatment is consistent with with HCD guidance. 
Okay, and then with regard to the, the choosing between a pipeline project and a housing element project, can you elaborate a bit on that? Because the pipeline units can still count towards the number of units, can't they? they, they yes, they will count towards the number of units. And, and, and I think what I was saying is, is that um, it, 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 it is at least more consistent, if not mandated by HCD guidance, to, to treat the project as, um, as it's proposed and, you know, depending on what happens today, entitled as opposed to some hypothetical future project at a different density. Right, right. And, and that's really what I meant when I talked about blatant misrepresentations of legal requirements. I mean, pipeline units count. I, I spoke to an HCD rep policy representative in this very room about a week and a half ago, and she confirmed that pipeline units do indeed count. It's a matter of making sure that you're following on with the, with the owner. So um, I, I just wanted to make sure that we clear up that, you know, what's been a, a clear misconception and misconstruction of legal requirements. Yeah, I, so. yeah. I mean, I, the pipeline units do count, and there, I mean, there, there's more certainty with respect to pipeline units than with respect to other units, um, just because, you know, you have them, they're, being pl they're planned or entitled or in some phase in the permitting process. So, right. um, so of course, there's a higher level of certainty that those units will actually be delivered. Right. That's not just a owner letter of interest. It's actually a full application. They're going through a process, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, uh, great. Well, um, I do see that the hands from our applicants are now no longer raised. Let me just uh, give a quick opportunity for either uh, Alok or Kelly. Did you want to make a comment? Because I know that uh, you guys had been referenced um, and so I don't see your hands raised back up. And so let me go on. I, I, I see that, uh, well, Alok, your, your, your camera's now on. Did you want to uh, make a comment uh, at this point? Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, sure. I think a quick comment um, is if there was a possibility of including a range of density uh, for, for this, uh, that includes the housing uh, element. Uh, so that would be between five and 20. I would be supportive because that would give me option to redo that if we choose to in future. So uh, that's what I stated. The council member Babe and I met her was the option would be to zone it at uh, five to twenty as recommended by the joint commission uh, back in uh, July or September. Okay, very good. Thanks very much. So let's go to, I believe it was Vice Mayor Chow that had the next comment and um, Council, I, I forget who we, we had on the floor. Was it Council Member Wei? Did you have the last comment and you're okay with uh, us moving? Okay, so let's go on to Vice Mayor Chow at this point. Vice Mayor. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation and thank you the applicant for Addressing the neighbors' concerns, it seems you have tried, uh, made a very good effort to do that. Um, I just want to ask for some clarification. I think there were some uh, concerns mentioned uh, by um, public comments in Planning Commission about privacy impacts of proposed balcony, especially on lot six. We know that balcony usually is uh, of concern for our residents. So I wonder if anything has been done to address that concern or maybe privacy screening to address those concerns. Another thing is about uh, fence height for lot six. I don't know what exactly is a concern and whether anything has been done to address that concern. I can help answer that. Um, the, the balcony on lot six, and I have to apologize, my, my computer is acting up and is not wanting to pull the plans up right now, but I can look to see on the presentation if I can share my screen just a second. Go ahead. Um, so, um, The balcony on uh, lot six is uh, located on the front of the property. So it is located somewhere along this particular area. And the property owner that uh, is concerned about it um, is, is located kind of um, southeast of that. So there is it, it is a long way off. We do not have any privacy uh, uh, requirements for uh, properties, uh, balconies that face the front yard necessarily. Um, and there is also not much room for planting uh, along this particular area to, um, uh, you know, accommodate a concern that's 
approximately, I would say between 150 and you know uh, 120 feet away. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is a fairly uh, far distance uh, for for to be able to see um, and to be impacted from those views. Uh, with regard to the fence, um, I believe the the property owner to the um, west, well, uh, to the left of this plan right now, uh, was uh, concerned that the uh, the fence that is proposed wasn't tall enough. But uh, the way that fences are measured in our city is that it's me actually measured from the uh, property that's higher, um, and so the fence is actually taller for the person that's uh, behind the property. So there's actually mm. more privacy for him. Mm. Okay, great, thank you. And then regarding Cherry Lane, Cherry, Cherry Lane is a private street. So are so are they going to have an agreement to from the Cherry Lane HOA to allow this new property to use Cherry Lane for egress? So there is a condition of approval when the Cherry Land development was approved to uh, to allow the ingress egress uh, on Cherry Land Drive for this particular property on the west. So there is a requirement that they have to see through. Um, with regard to the actual um, negotiation mm. and and whatever else that needs to occur, that needs to happen uh, between um, uh, this particular applicant and Cherry Land Drive, and um, th that's what they're figuring out right now. Okay. And that they need to have that sorted out before we issue permit. So I'm curious on how come the city is was has such a foresight to require egress on Cherry Lane at, at the time of approval. So this is what <laughs> we're planning. We sort of yeah. look ahead, and we wanted to make sure that there weren't multiple driveways that with multiple car, you know, uh, exits onto McClellan which was gonna have, a, you know, at that time, a, a class four bike lane, there were things that were planned for it. And so we wanted to make sure that the uh, the, um, uh, the points of conflict were minimized. And we, we understood that both of these properties were gonna develop. Mm, okay, so the Cherry Land HOA couldn't put up a fence along their property line that would not be, that would violate their condition of approval for their own Correct. property. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks for the questions. And we have, uh, Councilmember Way, your hand's still raised. Did you want to have a follow-up? Go ahead. Yes, that'll be great. Um, sorry, so I wanna just also clarify two points that uh, with Vice Mayor, uh, who's following you with the Cherry, Line, uh, Cherry, Cherry Land Homeowner Association. So um, if I understand it correctly, they need to have an agreement before the permit, we, uh, the RCD can give permits. Yeah, so we, we need to look at a maintenance agreement and, and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, have recorded ingress egress documents uh, from both parties. What if they cannot reach an agreement? Well, it is a condition of approval, so they're, they're, they're working their way through it. Okay, and the city, um, will we give them advice or we'll just let them work it out? I think we'll let them work it out. Okay, it, can we provide some customary or examples or uh, what's oh, going to be done or something in terms of language yes we can certainly help with what we've had in other developments we've, we've done that in the past but you know in this case i think that the holdup is not necessarily the language as much as other considerations mm. understand okay my second question is um i just heard um i think alok talk about um he would like to have this project to be a five to twenty units um, perform, uh, like agreement or something from the city, but he's doing the six units right now. If in case he changes his mind, he wants to do a higher density, will he be allowed to do that? No, not under the current general plan designation that he has. He can only build up to five dwelling units to the acre, which yields six units on this property. He is proposing 12 units on the property, including the ADUs. Um, also, um, I believe the Planning Commission's recommendation at that time was uh, potentially a minimum of 20 dwelling units a acre, not the minimum of five. So, so that this project would then become a legal non-conforming project. Okay. Um, so, so his request would not be able to um, go go through that. I mean, when I talked to him, I think he's he's he loved this project, would like to go on, but in case in the future he might want to develop. A different project, you would have to go through the whole whole right. plan amendment, things like that. Yes. Okay. 
and, and so I want to follow with one more question. What if he said, I want, I'm, I'm just, he, he wants to be in the housing element, doesn't want to do this anymore. Does he have an option to do that? He can, he can certainly abandon that. And if he wishes to be a housing element site, then, uh, you know, at this point, of course, the, the council has already acted on the site. So um, it would be, uh, you know, the, not necessarily in the draft housing element at this point, but, you know, it's something to consider for sure. Okay, so I think um, he's listening. So if you have questions, I think he can ask you or, um, you know, he can ask you to get started. Certainly. And we've talked multiple times. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Wei. And I'll go back to uh, Vice Mayor Chow and then Councilmember Moore. But before we do that, is there an appetite to place a motion on the uh, table for uh, further consideration? Mm. Sure. And so I see, mm. okay, uh, mm. Councilmember. Uh, Vice Mayor Chow, you said sure. So, uh, did you okay. want to put that um, um, recommended yeah, action on I'll the table? I'll make the motion to approve the staff recommendation that we find the project qualifies for CEQA exemption, adopt resolution number 22-129, approving the tentative map to subdivide the subject parcel into six lots. Adopt resolution number 22-130, approving the two-story permits on number as listed uh, in, the, in the agenda, and adopt resolution number 22-131, approving the minor residential permits. Okay, yeah. and Council Member Moore, did you want to second that for further discussion at this time? Certainly, second. Okay, thank you. And so we'll go in that order for the follow-on comments. Vice Mayor Chow, you're first, then Council Member Moore. Um, I think a common question people usually have is where the garbage cans are going to be. So okay. actually, uh, if I may, through the mayor, um, there is actually a great exhibit in the um, plans that show where the garbage cans are located. They're actually located outside the garage in different places, but they are on site, and there is a plan that shows how they're going to be uh, pulled out. Okay. And so not along the McClellan Road. It will have to be along McClellan Road because mm -hmm. the uh, recovery yeah. cannot go on the pavers that are on Sherryland Drive. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then final question is uh, actually this table on in the staff report. Uh, thank you for the, this really great comparison table of the existing zoning and versus the proposed. So we know that there is no rezoning necessary. However, we do know that zoning will be changed from R110 to R1-7.5, although that is consistent with the general plan. But doesn't that mean we do need to change the zoning of this site? I, I will let the city attorney take that particular one, but there is no action that the council is taking related to that at this time. Yeah, so, so there, there is no, no action to, to needed to t change the zoning at this time. Um, the relevance of our 1.75 standards is um, uh, under the Housing Accountability Act, when a project is, is consistent with general plan densities but not consistent with zoning, um, HCD guidance uh, uh, instructs cities to look towards other, other um, standards in their zoning ordinance that are that are appropriate uh, for the level of density that's allowed in the general plan. Um, here we do have you, you know a, um, standards for our one our one point seven one dash seven point five density um, in our zoning ordinance, and that would that allows the the, the density that um, is permissible under the general plan. And so, uh, planning staff applied those development mm -hmm. standards to this project, but uh, but a rezoning is not required to apply those standards. So. But the project still doesn't comply with the existing zoning. So that means in the future, we probably need to do a clean up the, of the zoning map to match the actual zoning to ma uh, just to, to match the, to make that 1-7.5. One, one right, we're, we're not required to do that, but that would eliminate but, a non-conforming use. That's correct. Yeah, so maybe that's something we would do in a future when we redo the zoning map. 
yeah, um, yeah. No, it it it, it, would, it would bring the, the the zoning in conformance with the um, planned future and uh, maybe ex eventually existing use. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's not a bad idea. It, it is not a requirement at this time, at least. Yeah, I remember city has done that before that they would do multiple rezoning to match existing uh, use. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, makes good administrative sense. So let's uh, go and uh, call on Council Member Moore. Did you have your hand raised for any uh, further comment or deliberation? So I was wondering if, if we could look at a floor plan real quick, um, perhaps for lot six. I just wanted to see how the, the ADU, uh, where the, the entrance is for that. Okay, floor plan for lot six, if anyone can bring that up. Right, so how, how do you get into the ADU? I'm, my Adobe just crashed. I'm, I'm gonna try to bring the plans up again, if you could just give me a minute. Okay, I can also ask another question, which was, um, I did see the, the new grading plan, um, and there were some changes to the bioretention basins, and if, uh, I, th I know it was mentioned that it was in the, the desk items, I was just curious what, why they needed to be changed. Uh, as I'm multitask, sorry, apologies for this um, uh, technical glitch, but um, the grading plan was uh, updated. There's actually a few clouds on the grading plan that indicate what was changed on the plans. Uh, my understanding is that the finished floor um, uh, that is indicated for the lots on the east side, for the lots that were on the original Cherryland development, uh, were um, uh, updated. And um, th that is the only change. There were no changes necessarily to the grades, I believe. So it doesn't make a difference to the actual proposed project. It's just a correction. Okay, and then I, I do see there's a, a plan on there. If, if someone could perhaps use their cursor, point to the ADU and where the entrance is um, to get into it. I have it up right here. And which lot now? Uh, oh, you have it up. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, it, the, so uh, this is something that um, a couple of things about the ADUs. The ADUs are not up for consideration tonight, only because that's a ministerial review. That that they, they could uh, they could come in without showing those ADUs and have those be approved as building permits. However, with that said, my understanding is that there does need to be a hinged door to these ADUs, and these are not necessarily uh, fully uh, developed at this point. So that needs to be reviewed by the building department and they will make their comments and if there are any changes that need to be made in order to accommodate those building code requirements, th those will have to be made to the ADU. However, as shown on these plans right now, um, the, the ADU is currently only uh, accessed by uh, sliding glass doors um, that is uh, to the uh, south of this shaded box that's shown on here. Okay, so I, I see that door, but um, what it's attached... That, that's a closet. That, that's not a, the main entrance where your cursor is, ma'am. Okay, um, I'm not sure who did that, but I, oh. I, see the, I see the sliding glass door to the south, and it's um, going, it's attaching to a large rectangular room, which appears to have a folding, some kind of a folding wall. Um, uh, that wall is, um, so there is um, a kitchen to the left, and then the, presumably it's a, it's a family living room. And then there is a bathroom to the, on the back, along the back. Um, my understanding is that the, um, directly across from the sliding glass doors is a laundry facility, and then the bedroom, the, do the door to the bedroom. So that's like a foyer right there. Okay. The so interior court. So oh. the ADU is kind of like a, a, a one bedroom Correct. Unit. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so that doesn't um, continue with further hands. And so, uh, Council Member Moore, your hand is still up. Did you want to follow up at this time? Uh, if not, uh, we do have a motion on the table for the recommended action and a second uh, from Vice Mayor Chow and Council Member Moore, respectively. And so, um, 
I'll do it going once and going twice. And so let's go ahead and have our city clerk conduct a roll call vote on this motion. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Way? Aye. Council Member Willie? Aye. Vice Mayor Chow? Aye. Mayor Paul? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Madam City Clerk. And uh, as we had indicated uh, previously, item 17, I don't believe council adopted consent items 9 through 13. I think we did actually. Um, okay, we adopted consent calendar, right? 9 through 13 and 17? I think that was in the motion. Yeah, that was in the motion. Yeah, okay, uh, no, no worries. Uh, thank you for, for, for uh, bringing that up though. Um, so item number 17 was part of our consent calendar and uh, we are on back to oral communications as continued. I don't see our member of the public uh, that was here earlier indicating um, that uh, she had wanted to speak on the city manager report. And so I'll go on to our last category of item prior to adjournment and that is the council and staff comments and future agenda items. Uh, let's go to staff first and Pamela, is there anything no? Okay, great. And so staff comments are concluded. Uh, now we have council comments or future agenda items. Uh, let's go in order. We'll have uh, one uh, bite at the apple each, uh, just to, you know, kind of uh, clarify that uh, ex ante. So council member Moore, you'll go first, followed by council member Willie and council member Moore. Okay, so I, I know that this is uh that time of year again where there are signs out so I would like to have the the sign ordinance um, revisited and uh, brought back so that uh, everyone's on the same page uh, with regards to that thank you thank you very much council member Moore council member Willie yeah so you know uh, we, we've got uh, quite a few uh, residents lately uh, you know concerned about the 5g a year ago, April, I had asked for a uh, updated study session. Do we have a date for that? And then I have a couple comments. Uh, sure. Let's. Um, why don't Why don't we uh, go to our city manager very briefly? My understanding is that we're looking at December sixth, but is is that, co that is correct, Mayor Paul. Okay. okay. Uh, go ahead, Councilor so Willie. Yeah. So so that's it. Now, a year and a half ago, in April, when I requested it that night. Um, you know, a resident had talked about uh, other cities and what their ordinances were. And that night you had said, oh, okay, John, you're going to consolidate those. And I did. That's going to be coming back as part of this. I provided that document from April of 21 uh, to the city manager. Now, what I'm asking for tonight is I'd like it to go back, I would like it to go to the Planning Commission, if at all possible, so that they can have their set of eyes. Uh, you know, they're looking at it also from a technical standpoint, and uh, otherwise it's gonna come straight to us, and we're not gonna have any um, review by the uh, Planning uh, Commission. Um, so, so okay, Councilor Willie, let me let me uh, refer this to uh, both our city attorney and our city manager. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I think um, kind of thinking about the date right now, October eighteenth, it might be a little bit of a squeeze. Um, but uh, in any event, let, let, let's talk about this procedurally as well as substantively, um, presumably. And yes. So, uh, um, city attorney Johnson. So the plan the planning commission doesn't by code have any jurisdiction over this particular ordinance. Um, uh, it would be within council's discretion to refer the matter to the planning commission. Um, that would require uh, that that to be agendized and voted on by council. Okay, so let's let's think through this. I just for for scheduling purposes, if we were to put this on on the November first meeting, um, we could potentially get that um, directed, and then planning commission meets on the Tuesdays that we don't meet, right? And so it would probably be too late for November 8th. Um, two weeks after that would be 15, 23rd. I, I don't know if the Planning Commission is having a meeting on the week of Thanksgiving, um, but uh, I guess technically it might be able to, you know, happen. But, uh, okay, well, uh, uh, Council Member Willie, your uh, request is taken under advisement. We'll, uh, okay. do, and um, City Manager Wu, is there any other follow-on um, that you wanted to make at this time? 
Um, we could also consider um, Council Member Willie's request as part of December 6th study session for the actual ordinance to be reviewed by the plan by the Planning Commission, but not at this juncture. That's true. That's a good point. Okay. Uh, very good. Thanks very much. And so, Councilmember Willie, uh, we will uh, go. Did you have any further uh, follow-ons at yeah. this time? So, so then, well, a plan B might be that, you know, the material that's going to be presented at the uh, at the meeting for us, if that could be provided to the uh, planning department, and they could, at the very least, review it at their discretion and give us whatever thoughts they have. Uh, okay. Well, Councilmember Willie, I think we've um, kind of exhausted the limits of what we can really, you know, go over uh, under this item for for this. But uh, but uh, duly noted, and uh, I commit to you that we will follow up on this. Um, and so let's uh, go on to Vice Mayor Chow at this time. Vice Mayor Chow. I, for the record, I think about a month ago, planning commissioners have requested that um, they should they be allowed to come in on the small cell ordinance, and the council. Um, I think I did inquire to the city attorney, and then there was i think it's our mismanagement of timeline otherwise it would have been possible so i want to point that out and um, and also i want uh, some clarification because in the past the council city council or school board has been making uh, is responding to public comment with short responses per brown act this is allowed in almost every Brown Act training. training uh, it does say we are allowed to respond to question or comments in non-agenda items. So I would like to get, um, but then the city, but the mayor, um, right now there is, doesn't seem to be a space to provide. So I would like to, uh, um, okay. Whether well, agendize we'll, we'll, this okay. or figure out a way that the council has a method to provide responses per permitted under Brown Act. Okay, Vice Mayor, okay. I, I will take that under advisement, uh, and it's appreciated. It's, it's good to get clarity with regard to uh, what constitutes the um, brief uh, clarifying information and, and brief when to do it. Uh, right well, now. okay, so we, we will go ahead and, and clarify that. I, I think we could probably do that briefly in the next meeting, I would imagine, perhaps mm -hmm. even under city manager's, um, you know, uh, reports. Um, but, but you know, we can go ahead and um, get some public clarity as to the scope of uh, what's permissible. And I, I think that is uh, a fair, fair point, and uh, without expounding on it, um, our city attorney was requesting uh, to speak, and, and Chris, did you want to uh, follow on at this time? Oh, I, I don't think it's necessary to follow on at this time. I, I'm happy to have a discussion about sort of what level of response is appropriate to public comment with the vice mayor and council, and we can um, clarify that at a public meeting if, if, Absolutely. if necessary. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, we, we all know that the, uh, the aims here are to have public clarity and transparency and you know, and, and to have the appropriate notice um, uh, in balance with all the usual um, aspirations of equity and fairness. So, um, so, so absolutely, I, I think we're all on the same page here. So, Vice Mayor Chad, did you want to follow on to your comments at this time? I just want to be sure that the main issue is right now there is not a time in our agenda to even do that. It's not with the level of response. Okay. Yeah, that's the issue. Okay. Well, th thank you, Vice Mayor. I, I think we can clarify those points uh, w without getting into the substance of them uh, at this time. But you know, duly noted as well. So thanks very much. Um, you know, I, I just want to encourage everyone to um, you know be uh, civil and open out there. I, I know that this is uh, a real privilege in our um, you know in our system to be able to uh, kind of vet a lot of things <laughs> over the course of. Uh, uh, these these months and weeks and so um, yeah you know be good to each other and I think that we can uh, get to uh, you know a, a fantastic place and stay there and you know keep maintaining uh, the course of uh, positive actions so um, thank you very much I uh, appreciate everyone's uh, work here uh, 
vice, uh, not vice uh, city manager Wu, you just turned on your microphone. Did you want to make a, a brief comment before we adjourn the meeting? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Mayor Paul. Just want to follow up on um, the items that were brought up just now. So okay, Council great. Member Moore would like to see a sign ordinance being brought back. Um, I didn't hear any support of that. Just want to make sure that is it just a comment or is there enough interest for, uh, for staff to bring it back? And if so, is there a particular area for the sign ordinance? I, I heard it as a sign ordinance, um, you know, update. Is that or, or just you know maybe not a study session, but perhaps a summary of it? Was that correct? Um, yes, yeah, so I'd like people to know what the sign ordinance actually is, um, and and I think I'd actually add on banners. Um, that would also be important. Um, there was a, an issue which came up regarding all of the commercial banners, um, which. Uh, came in during the COVID time, and it was found that uh, one complaint uh, regarding one banner ended up uncovering that a, maybe like 100 banners had not been properly permitted. Let's, uh, so let, 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 let's get to the kind, kind of procedural uh, mm -hmm. issue of what's being requested. So would a memo suffice if I that was something that was- I want the public to know it. That's where oh, okay. you run into the, the issue because it's more about right. providing uh, the public information about this This is our sign ordinance and also for banners too because I'm seeing um, some that aren't actually advertising the business that they're around. They're right. advertising other things. Well, I, I would property. say, well, okay, again, without expounding into the substance of it, but I, I think a memo could be made an informational item and placed on consent, right? Mm -hmm. and it could would, work that way. Right, sure. okay, that would work. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, and so, Madam City Manager, I guess we had Council Member Willie and then Council Member uh, Vice Mayor Chow. Right, so my understanding is that um, Council Member Willie's um, request is on 5G, which we um, tentatively commit to bring it back on December 6th, and Council uh, Vice Mayor Chow's request will be handled by city attorney separately and also individually with each individual city council. Just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Oh, I, you know, I, I think Vice Mayor Chow's request is very similar to Council Member Moore's request in that there was a desire for that to be, you know, made publicly known is that is that fair? I mean, I, I don't think that's a privileged attorney, you know, uh, communication, right? I mean, that should be something that is, um, you know, good for general consumption as well. No, it's it's not. We we could just uh, it, it w won't require a, a lengthy discussion. I could just mention it at the appropriate time in our next meeting. Okay, sounds good. All right. Thank you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you very much. And um, that definitely, you know, adds a lot of clarity to. Oh, and just uh, you know. Um, just to kind of dot the I and cross the T on this, I'll go ahead and second anything that's requested of these, you know, several items from, from my colleagues. So, okay, well, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's October 18th. Our next regularly scheduled council meeting is on November 1st. And so, uh, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor, did you want to make a comment or was there something else? Did I, uh, so, now that, um, as we are clarifying when or what short responses uh, are allowed. I hope also to get a clarification on the item that currently council member announcements. Um, because announcements, it used to be that we would uh, talk about comments we received from the residents and when we may not be at during the public meeting, but I would mention, okay, here's what I heard and then I, give a short response, but I was stopped today. So I want to get a good clarification on if there are issues residents brought up, and then is that the appropriate time to respond to that and during the short announcement? Because I think people have done that before and they were not stopped. So I Okay, want to well, thank you, Vice Mayor. I think your, um, yeah, I think your point has been made and um, we and, uh, uh, bid you a good yeah, evening. Another issue is, uh, I sent uh, this to city clerk already that I think probably many people need to know. Uh, many uh, volunteers have been told that yard signs are not allowed to touch the ground on a city uh, property. Vice Mayor, I, I, so I, I, we need I, I, I want to cut you off here. For everyone I, I understand, but let's not issue. get into the substance of an oral communication at yeah. this time. So uh, yeah, okay. thank you very much. I understand that we all have a lot of uh, a fervor for a lot of the issues that 
are presented to us. Mm -hmm. But at this time, from a procedural perspective, uh, this is let us go. This similar to Council Member Moore's request for the information. So right, why but is that? we had the count. We had we had everyone had their turn, right, Vice Mayor, and then okay. City Manager Wu wrapped up. And so let's go ahead and uh, respect the uh, agenda. And so. Okay. Uh, at this time, we're at adjournment, and uh, we bid everyone a great evening and Council have a rest. Uh, Willie has his hand up. Uh, Council Member Willie does uh, have his hand up, but uh, let me, well, in the interest of fairness, uh, <laughs> Council Member Willie, since I uh, was uh, willing to entertain Vice Mayor Chow, uh, what, Council, Council Member Willie, did you have any uh, concluding comments at this time? Yes, because the, the city manager said she didn't hear, you know, that there was more support for Councilman Moore's uh, Stein coming back to us by all means. And so, yes, I had already spoken. So how am I supposed to support this? Support uh, yes, uh, Council Member Willie, I, I, I apologize. I think you probably missed that part where I told the city manager that I would go ahead and second anything that was brought up. Oh, uh, that's right. You did say that. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, everyone, uh, have a great night. We will see you on November 1st for our next regularly scheduled uh, city Council meeting for the City of Cupertino. Thank you very much and meeting adjourned.